Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Ways and Means hearing for Thursday, February 25th. Uh, before us today, we have nine different bills. Uh, we have one bill related to racing and gaming, two related to economic development, followed by six that have to do with the tax issues. Uh, many people are here today for our first bill, and we're quite honored to have the Speaker of the House, Adrian Jones, testifying on her bill, uh, House Bill 940. Uh, I believe she's also joined today by several of our colleagues who've been working on this uh, bill in the past year, Delegates Ebersole, Delegate Barnes, Delegate Lutke, and then uh, there's two others with the Speaker's panel, Deputy Secretary Earl Lewis from MDOT and Emmanuel ba Bailey. Madam Speaker, uh, go ahead. Great to have you today. All right, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Chair Kaiser, members of House Ways and Means Committee and guests. I'm testifying today in support of House Bill 940, uh, the gaming regulation of fantasy gaming competitions and implementation of sports wagering. That's a mouthful, it's an important bill. As you will all remember, Last year, this committee passed a constitutional amendment to allow sports betting in Maryland that overwhelmingly passed on the ballot in November. Um, <clears throat> along with the requirement of a disparity study of commercial gaming in Maryland. At the end of October, we received the findings of the disparity study review of the expansion of commercial gaming in Maryland, which found that minorities have historically been shut out of meaningful participation in the gaming industry in Maryland. This legislation before you today sets out to do three things. Number one, put a framework in place for a sports betting program in Maryland that ensures that Maryland is competitive with our surrounding states. It increases proceeds to the Blueprint Fund for Maryland to pay for our 10-year public school education plan. This committee has worked hard over the past several years to ensure that every child will receive a stellar education regardless of their zip code. It maximizes the opportunities for minority businesses to be meaningful participants, both in equity ownership and in procurement contracts in this new state created industry. As was mentioned, with me today are Majority Leader Eric Lukey, Black Caucus Chairman Daryl Barnes, and longtime sponsor of similar legislation, Delegate Eric Ebersole to demonstrate the House's commitment to these tenants as the committee considers this legislation. Deputy Secretary Earl Lewis will talk about the findings of the disparity study. And also uh, with me today is Mr. Emmanuel Bailey, a Maryland minority business owner to talk about the importance of this legislation. Obviously, there are a number of different views on how to best implement this program in the state. You will hear from a number of different witnesses today, but I encourage the committee to remain focused on the three main objectives that I outlined above. A fair framework, increasing education funding, and maximizing meaningful opportunities for everyone as you begin work on this bill. With that, I, I urge a favorable report on House Bill 940. And now I'd like to turn it over to Delegate Ebersol to talk specifically about the legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the logistics of, of the sports wagering bill. Um, the, there are two basic categories of a sports wagering facilities, we'll call it one site licenses, or if you like, brick and mortar, and there are mobile licenses. <clears throat> site licenses, we broke it down into two classes. Sometimes we call them physical licenses. Class A, uh, there will be eight uh, physical licenses. They will be available to the casinos and certain racetracks. Uh, uh, class B 
will be five more competitively bid physical licenses. Um, and then there will be mobile licenses, which will all be competitively bid. And the bill sets aside 10 of those. Um, physical licenses, uh, the tax rate will be 15% of the proceeds to the state and 85% of the proceeds. And by proceeds, we mean revenues that they realize from the amount of money they win from people. That's gambling business. They will win money from people. Mobile licenses, the tax rate is 15% on the first $5 million of revenues or proceeds. Once uh, one of them or all, any of them exceed $5 million, the tax rate for the balance of that money going forward in that year will be 17.5%. All of this money will be reverted to the blueprint fund, okay? Um, there are also some specified fees and annual fees, and I will go over them. There's a lot of numbers, so if we wanna drill back on them, we certainly can. The applicant fee for a class A physical license will be $250,000. For a class B site license will be $50,000. And the uh, applicant fee for a mobile sports wagering license will be $500,000. The holder of a sports wagering license shall pay to the commission an annual fee after that of $50,000 a year for class A, $10,000 for a class B on site, and the mobile license will be $100,000 a year. If you look at those numbers, they are proportional to the application fee. The term of a sports wagering license will be five years. Um, upon application of the sports wagering license and payment of the license renewal fee, the commission may renew for five more years a sports wagering license if the licensee complies with all statutory and regulatory requirements. The license renewal fee, which will come up after five years, is equal to 1% of the licensee's average annual gross sports wagering revenues for the preceding five year period. These monies again will all go to the blueprint fund. You can look at the uh, fiscal and policy note to see how much money is predicted. Although I will say that it's a difficult thing to predict in as much as we're entering a new era and how much interest or how little interest there will be will be something of uh, a bit of a study for us to watch happen. I'm, I'm very op optimistic. Um, people that may gamble must be 21 years of age or older. They must be, if they're mobile licensing, they must be in the state. There will have to be geofencing and age registration for those that want to bet. And uh, you can look in the uh, fiscal note and also see a list of which sports would be uh, included and not. Let's make it easy. Uh, high school sports and other uh, lesser sports will not be uh, part of that. Um, there's a couple of brief questions, like uh, if we're having e-game competitions, uh, what we would do with those. Um, E-game competitions, uh, all the participants that you're betting on would have to be um, 18 years of age or older. Otherwise, that one would not be eligible for wagering. There's a number of other, um, a number of other uh, requirements, but we can see if people have questions on them. Um, that's a basic outline. And uh, with that, uh, there are a number of considerations uh, about ownership. There will be a sports wagering application review commission and as we get toward that, I think um, with the chair's permission and the speaker's permission, I will defer to Delegate Barnes for that. All right, uh, thank you, Delegate Barnes. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, I'm Delegate Daryl Barnes here to testify in support of House Bill 940. Uh, in the interest of time, I'd like to speak briefly on the MBE compliance within the bill. I want to commend the bill sponsor uh, for adding language that ensures that there will be minority participation in this multi-million dollar industry uh, coming before the state of Maryland. Black caucus members still remember minority businesses being completely shut out a few years ago when the state awarded 15 initial licenses uh, in the medical cannabis industry. Given this, it is our responsibility to ensure that we learn from those mistakes and make a commitment to award some percentage of sports betting licenses to minority owners the first time around. For quite some time, the state has operated a robust MBE program in an attempt to remedy discrimination. These efforts have reduced, not eliminated, the effects of discrimination in public procurement. We have a grand opportunity with the implementation of sports betting 
to ensure that we craft a model that pro promotes fairness, diversity, inclusion within this industry. House Bill 940 is a step in the right direction. I am absolutely committed to crafting the best piece of legislation that ensures those goals. As chairman of the Maryland Legislative Black Caucus and a small business advocate, I believe it's imperative that we do not overlook these disparities. A 2017 disparity study provided a comprehensive analysis, ultimately establishing that minorities and women in Maryland market areas continue to experience significant disparities in the area to state and private sectors, contracts, and those factors for business success. There has been vivid individual accounts of discriminatory barriers, evidence, support the conclusion, and affirmation, I mean affirmative intervention is still needed to dismantle the exclusion of racial and gender groups from the private sector market. I am willing to work closely with our subcommittee chairwoman, as I'm sure she will do a wonderful job in ensuring that we have diversity and equity and inclusion within this bill. And for those reasons, I ask for a favorable vote. I'd like to pass it on now. Oh, I'm sorry. Delegate, Delegate Barnes, uh, I first, I, I wanna say that uh, I thank you for what you just said. And there is no doubt that we have made past mistakes in how we uh, support our MBEs in the state. And I'm glad we didn't simply pass the Senate bill last year that didn't accommodate this and that we took the time uh, to look at this. Uh, we are going a little bit out of order from earlier. I know that Mr. Bailey has to leave soon. Uh, Emmanuel Bailey. Thank you. Thank you. I very much appreciate it. I'm very honored uh, uh, by being here, uh, Madam Chairman and Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's given me an opportunity to kind of speak on this bill. I, I got to tell you, I wholeheartedly support uh, Madam Speaker's bill. Delegate Barnes just kind of outlined all of the specific issues uh, with respect to why this bill is important, necessary, and critical. Uh, let me give you just a quick background on my personal uh, life. Uh, I've been a long-term Maryland taxpayer. I uh, went to both elementary, junior high, and high school here, as well as college. I'm a proud graduate of the University of Maryland Smith School of Business. Uh, from a professional standpoint, I can tell you that I have 25 plus years of experience in banking, finance, human resources, IT, and gaming operations experience. I've been a bonded officer at several publicly traded uh, companies, uh, most recently at Fannie Mae, where I served as a vice president reporting directly to the CEO. I hold a top secret uh, clearance uh, in the federal space. Primarily, I deal with the what we call the three-letter agencies, uh, DOD, DISA, uh, NSA, CIA. Uh, I've owned and operated businesses um, in Maryland and the Maryland capital region since about 19, the late 1990s. I'm aging myself here. Um, and currently I have 28 employees in the state of Maryland uh, and uh, located in Prince George's County. I've been involved specifically in uh, Maryland and pursuing Maryland procurements uh, since uh, 2000 most recently in the gaming space in 2016 with the state's lottery and related services uh, contract. Um, I can tell you one of the reasons uh, I think Delegate Barnes so eloquently outlined and the speaker has um, as well many times appreciate the focus on MBE participation. Let me give you a contextual uh, comment in terms of why I uh, make that comment. In Maryland, which is about a $3 billion lottery, about 70% of those sales come from just two counties. That's Prince George's County and Baltimore City. That's not unique to Maryland. You look at Ohio, it's about a $2 billion lottery. It's the same. There are 44 US state lotteries representing about $87 billion in annual sales of which 60 to 70% of those sales come from people of color, particularly African-Americans. So it's really important uh, and why we understand why the speaker's bill is coming forward is because 
in most industries, most commercial industries, what has happened of late post George Ford is the focus on orienting the senior management team to what their market is. Market is very diverse. Management at the CEO level is not. I just mentioned that the Maryland lottery, not the Maryland lottery, but the industry, the lottery business is about a $87 billion a year business. Only two African-Americans have been appointed to serve as the lottery, state lottery directors. So there's an imbalance that this bill um, in an inverted way will, will seek to correct. Um, I, I think it's very important to note that in Maryland, they have MWAB, Minority and Women Owned Businesses, goals. Goals, and I stress the word goals because goals are not laws. In other states uh, and jurisdictions like DC, there are actual laws that mandate the participation at an equity level, an ownership level, a leadership and management and operations level of minority and women owned form, firms. I don't separate the two. The reason why I don't separate the two, if you look at the casinos and the operations in Maryland, um, there are very few, I'm not aware of any African-American that is the general manager of any of your state issued licenses related to casinos. Uh, and I think, and I fear, and this is why the speaker's bill is so important that this would correct, not only from a contracting side, but also from an operation side. I would also tell you that with respect to Maryland, and I've been pursuing contracts in Maryland since the late 1990s. We have about 28 employees in Maryland. We have one contract in Prince George's County, one small contract in the state of Maryland. And I can tell you that my experience with respect to Maryland is that, and I'll just be very direct about it. In my personal view, and I won't, don't wanna make any pejorative statements here, is that Maryland, in my view, has been almost, not just recalcitrant, but almost hostile as it relates to particularly African-American-owned prime businesses. Because if you look at your MBE program, it's almost exclusively focused on subcontracting. Subcontracting doesn't involve equity, if you look at the way that the MBE DOD department reviews and assesses compliance with that program, uh, it is really not focused on keeping the same MBE. So what happens is when prime contractors get an award and they have a whatever the, uh, I think the state's um, mandated percentage is 20%, what happens is contractors are not held accountable to conducting business with that same contractor. So they then get an award from the state with public dollars, and then they go out and do a separate procurement and the lowest price wins. Irrespective of if that low price will seek and serve and confirm that that business is gonna go out of business. And then they just bring in another MBE to perform those services. Yet at the county, the state level, they still will show that they have met the minimum requirement. And that doesn't serve anybody well. What I have really been focused on and looking at, and I have pursued contracts in multiple states throughout the United States, particularly on IT and gaming services, uh, is that only a few jurisdictions like DC do not have goals. They have promulgated law that dictate that if there's a contract with state dollars, that there is a mandate um, that um, incorporates women and minority owned business. I can speak about DC, for example. Um, you know, I've been involved in the first United States approved internet gaming law. I've been involved in the first GSC sponsored sports betting and wagering law after the pass of the Supreme Court decision on PASPA, none of that would have been possible without the mandatory promulgated settled law of the District of Columbia, not goals, 
to have minority participation. It's the reason why I was able to have a 51%, 49% lead equity partnership in a globe, the third largest global gaming company. Mr. Bailey, can you uh, wrap things up? I will. Um, let me juxtapose that against the law in Maryland versus what the federal government does under the SBA ABA 8A program, which is not a goal, but they take 25% of everything the federal government spends and they, and they call that out only to businesses that would have the equivalent of an MBA license, an MBE, MBE license. In Maryland, as I mentioned, it's a goal and primarily is focused on subcontracting. That doesn't lead to equity ownership, doesn't lead to the, the opportunity to develop capacity and to bid as a prime. I will leave it at that. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bailey. Really appreciate your testimony. Uh, we next have uh, Delegate Lupe, the Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Speaker, Delegate Eversall, Delegate Barnes, Mr. Bailey. Um, appreciate all the comments so far. And I just want to uh, bring us back a little bit to the, the scope of the, the speaker's comments at the beginning. Um, most members of this committee were not around the last time we undertook a major debate in the legislature around the expansion of commercial gaming in Maryland. Um, and these debates are by their nature complex and, and difficult debates. Um, and we will, and I'm, I'm sure members of this committee have already heard from, we will hear from many different interests, many special interests, interests that are particular particular businesses, particular uh, regional interests. Um, but as you know, and as, as this uh, committee has consistently uh, uh, stood up for, um, our job is, is to find the, the public interest, right? And, and the speaker outlined some of that public interest in her comments at the beginning of this hearing. We have an interest in making sure that our commercial gaming industry is competitive with other states. And this bill will make us competitive with neighboring states by ensuring that uh, there is access to sports betting as the voters approved um, in brick and mortar sites at, at casinos and other sites around the state. Um, we have an interest in getting the revenue we need to fund the programs that we care about. And this bill does that. It will raise revenue for our schools. We also have an interest and it's an interest that we have historically uh, neglected in this state. We have an interest in making sure that everyone in every community has an opportunity to fully participate in every industry that exists in this state. And the reality is that uh, minority owned businesses and in particular black owned businesses are often at a significant disadvantage in the marketplace, have not had the same opportunities as other businesses in the marketplace. So in, in crafting this bill, the, the speaker set a, a, a very clear agenda which is that we want to create the opportunity for minority business owners, black business owners, to own equity in these licenses in a way that this state has, has rarely, if ever, provided in the gaming industry. If you look at us historically, the horse racing industry, at the OTBs, at the, uh, the, the uh, bingo parlors, these are almost all, almost entirely, historically. I need you to come back, please. They're historically almost all white owned. So the provisions of this bill have been crafted very carefully by the speaker and by other folks involved um, to abide by legal standards, but to set Maryland out as the national leader in providing opportunities for minority business ownership and minority business equity in the gaming industry. And I will tell you, I've been involved in gaming issues on this committee for a decade now. And I know a fair number of people in the industry. And I've had people from literally all over the country tell me Maryland is setting the standard. What we're doing with this bill will change the gaming industry in America. It will make sure that this industry um, creates opportunities, as Mr. Bailey uh, laid out, that we have not created historically, that we create opportunities for people of color to own businesses, to create wealth, um, you know, to create a truly equitable economy. Um, so, you know, I, I, uh, I, I want to conclude my remarks by just commending the speaker for this bill and the tremendous amount of work that has gone into it um, and the members of this committee for continuing to, to, to stand by the public interest as our watchword 
Um, I think we need to continue to, to particularly look to those three common themes of public interest here. Um, and in particular, to make sure that we are setting that national standard on equity. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Delegate Lutke. And uh, the last person on this panel we have is uh, MDOT Deputy Secretary Earl Lewis. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Kaiser, Vice Chair Washington, and members of the committee. For the record, I am R. Earl Lewis, Jr., Deputy Secretary of Policy, Planning, and Enterprise Services at the Maryland Department of Transportation. While the Maryland Department of Transportation takes no position on House Bill 940, I'm happy to be a part of the panel to provide information on the studies and other reports that MDOT is required to initiate for the purpose of determining whether there is a compelling interest to implement remedial measures to assist minorities and women in state contracting as well as in emerging industries. As many of you may know, the General Assembly established the state's minority business enterprise program in 1978, an MBA program statute <laughs> requires that MDOT initiate an availability utilization study, what people, people frequently refer to as a disparity study for the state of Maryland every few years. That study helps us determine whether and to what extent the state can continue to implement the MBE program in light of federal and constitutional requirements. Based on the most recent disparity study, which was issued in 2017, the General Assembly determined that there was evidence of discrimination in Maryland and they reenacted the MBE program law. Senate Bill 4, which was passed during the 2020 session, required MDOT and the Maryland Lottery and Gaming Control Commission to contract with an expert to evaluate whether the state's 2017 disparity study provides a compelling interest to implement remedial measures in the sports wagering industry. The commission engaged keen independent research to conduct an industry analysis to identify the projected scope of work that could be a part of the sports waging, wagering industry, and the keen report was completed in September of 2020. MDOT submitted the Keene report to NERA, the state's disparity study consultant, to determine whether those codes were in the 2017 study. NERA completed its report in October 2020. Section 91E04C and 91E15H of the 2021 bill, House Bill 940, require that the commission in consultation with MDOT and the Office of the Attorney General evaluate a study, meaning the 2020 Keene and NERA reports, determine whether there is a compelling interest to implement remedial measures in the sports wagering industry. As indicated on page one of the NEAR report, the disparity study consultant found that while the exact mix of work cannot be known to the specification for proficient forms, means of conduct, and premises for wagering are established, the 2017 disparity study very likely provides a strong basis and evidence for the application of the Maryland MBE program, the type of work involved in the proposed expansion of commercial gaming. At the end of the report on page seven, NIR reminds us of the need to ensure that any race or gender-based mechanisms applied to the gaming industry be carefully established and implemented in a manner consistent with the law. So again, thank you for having me here today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have as well. Thank you very much. Uh, questions uh, for the speaker and her panel. We'll start with Delegate Buckle. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. And I don't know, you know, whoever feels uh, most uh, capable to answer this, please feel free. I, I guess my question, I want to dive down a little bit into how we're going to uh, establish or implement the minority MBE or set aside or preference programs. My understanding, I'm certainly not an expert in it, but my understanding for doing, doing some litigation for all my life is that there's one way to do it by saying you set aside a certain targeted percentage of services, you know, vendors, a certain number of subcontractors, things of that nature uh, would be MBE businesses. So you say, you know, 20%, 25%, 35% of all of the, the vendors or subcontractors to an entity, uh, gaming entity would be MBEs. And then there's another way to do it that says for the awarding of the license itself, we're going to set forth criterion uh, that would have some beneficial or weighted effect or impact uh, for racial minorities to, to offset perceived disparities or perceived past uh, discrimination in a field. And then what I've heard some talk about is a third way that I, I haven't heard us do before, which is to say that we're going to mandate that in order to get a license, you have to provide actual, equitable, legal, financial ownership of a certain percentage to an MBE. And I'm, I may just be confused. Which one of the three 
or are we doing all three of those approaches inherent in this bill? Is it, is it setting aside services like we do for casinos now? I know we've had bills in our committee about Rock, Rocky Gap Casino in my area has had difficulties in some years meeting those targets because of the lack of minority businesses in Western Maryland. Are we setting up a preferential system for the ranking and awarding of licenses? Or are we mandating that if you wanna have a license, you have to have a certain percentage of minority equity ownership in your, in your licensee? All right, uh, thank you, Delegate Buckle. That's a, a great question. And, and I do think it needs to be clarified. It looks like, uh, um, I think Delegate Barnes and Delegate Lukey might both want to. I would defer to Delegate Barnes, Madam Chair. Yeah. Delegate Barnes. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Delegate Buckle. I think your, your second approach is the route in which we're looking at uh, more of a uh, uh, scoring criteria. Uh, if you look at what we did with medical cannabis uh, and the regulations in which we did to ensure that uh, people that wanted to participate in that industry uh, to obtain a license, uh, looking at the scoring mechanism in which they created, uh, is something that I think we would follow uh, for this uh, scoring uh, for sportsmen. Okay, thank you. And did uh, Delegate Lutke or anyone else wanna add to that? I would just add, uh, Delegate Barnes is correct, right? We the. Um, the intent is equity participation. The commission will have to review the disparity study first, right? Right. Um, but in addition, we do require in the bill that uh, uh, licensees have to try to meet the, the services and, and subcontracting goals in state law. And, and that's all, you know, all I want to say is I think all of you know that served me in the committee, uh, Delegate Hornberger and I, I think we're the first people in the state to put in a bill seeking to authorize the sports gambling probably five years ago, four years ago. We're very committed. I know I am very committed to getting this uh, operation up and running for the betterment of everyone. I, I don't want to see anything stand in the way of that. My only concern is whatever we do, I want to make sure that it is not susceptible to a plethora of lawsuits that may or may not be uh, successful so that we can get up and running quickly. We're already years behind some of our regional competitors. And so that's why, you know, a preference system to me that says, hey, if you have minority participation or minority ownership that, that helps you to get a license, that can be legal, but I'll leave it to better legal minds than myself. There are also situations where federal courts have said that is illegal uh, without certain predicates. And so, you know, I, I wanna, wanna just make sure we're all aware of that as we move through uh, and complete those, those, those criteria and scoring. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lewis, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would say um, the comments all here are, are relevant. Obviously, there are actually dozens of NAICS codes that the disparity study and the Keene study had overlap, which was really good news regarding using the 2017 disparity study. Obviously, how the legislature structures the actual program regarding you know, the participants and the different sectors of the industry will, will, will impact what the legitimate goals will be that we can constitutionally be sure we'll stand up to, to, to muster. But I think the multi-decade MBE program gives us a great basis to be able to figure out how to do that successfully. Thank you. There, there are provisions in the bill. If you look around page 31, you'll see some of the things around these, uh, the awarding uh, committee. Um, there, it's general language, but there is some stuff there. Uh, it's it's a, there are a few places in the bill that you can find uh, language referencing this, uh, and we'll certainly have enough time to get through that in subcommittee. Uh, Delegate Hornberger has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank the panel for the presentation. Uh, we don't usually get this kind of treatment in ways and means, so it's good to have all these different folks weighing in, and uh, anyone can answer uh, this question. Uh, I, so I just want to interject here and say that frequent. Okay. Keep going, delegate. That's someone's yep. recording for some reason. Okay. Uh, the um, I think the analogy is good of looking at the medical cannabis industry because what we're already seeing in that industry is that some of the small businesses, some of the local purveyors, uh, you know, residency, et cetera, a, a number of those folks are already being bought out by the big guys. And what I mean by that is uh, they might not be able to purchase the actual license itself but they, they can encumber all sales, all profits, et cetera, for five, six, seven, eight years. 
and they can offer, uh, you know, in, in exchange for that, a, a large cash amount up front uh, to be able to take over their sales in the out years. So even though there's some protections in place that say you can't explicitly transfer ownership of the license, you, you can uh, delegate your right to make profits in the future. And what's happening is a lot of these much larger industry players uh, have that capital laying around and are really swooping in and, you know, I don't want to, I don't use the word stealing, but for cash pay up front, they're, they're able to take over all that ability to build wealth for these smaller players that were trying to get into the industry. And really there's no way to kind of claw that back or preserve that ability to make wealth. So I, you know, I could potentially see, especially in this market, which is huge and wildly lucrative, the ability for someone to come in and say, hey, that equity that you have or that, um, you know, that, that deal that you had to make to get entry to the market, I'd like to purchase that out. I'd like to buy that out. So now that you have the license, um, I'm willing to offer you the next five to 10 years of profits plus 20%. If, if you'll surrender that ownership to me. So I didn't see anything in the bill that specifically preserves the ability to continue to generate wealth. And um, I was just wondering if I, if I missed it or if there's a way that we can ensure that once these, once these folks that we want to incentivize get the ownership, that they keep it and then keep the ability to continue to make profits in the future. Uh, thank you, Delegate Hornberger. Uh, and that's a great question because I do think the five-year relicensing does not fully address your question. Uh, does anyone have an answer? Anybody from those who testify, Delegate Barnes? You know, uh, Delegate uh, Holmberg, I, 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 you're spot on. And that's a, a conversation in which we've had to ensure the integrity of the license itself uh, to make right. sure that uh, we're not uh, putting people in position for failure. Uh, so we're, we're really looking at that. And once again, I go back to medical cannabis and looking at uh, some of the lessons learned. Uh, and I think we'll be able to apply those things uh, here in this new industry to ensure that uh, those that qualify uh, for a license are in a position to uh, sustain that license for a long period of time. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, there's also an analogy to be made kind of like with an IPO once stocks are released, uh, you know, I think in the stock trader world, they call it a blackout period where you can't sell. Yeah. And that, that also protects the value of said equity. Mm -hmm. Because if, if, one, if one group wants to reach in and swoop all that up at one point in time, it could, it could have a disastrous effect, not only on our market, but the competition of said market and the ability of the state to make revenues off of it. So I, I look forward to working with you on that if, if uh, you're so inclined and, and thank you for bringing this bill forward. Absolutely. And I'm sure a lot of that uh, conversation and work will be done in subcommittee, but you're, you're spot on with your analysis. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, and good thing you're on that subcommittee, Delegate Hornberger. Yeah, looking uh, forward to it. Are there any other questions for uh, the speaker and her panel? All right. Uh, thank you again, uh, Madam Speaker, and to your panelists. Uh, to members, we have uh, 25 other people signed up to testify today. Uh, mostly in favor, or I guess half in favor, half a favorable uh, with amendment. Um, so we don't necessarily have to ask the exact same questions of, of all the people over and over, but you know, look for the right person uh, to ask and everyone has um, those signed up on their uh, floor system to see uh, who's coming up to speak. Uh, we will start with uh, Gary Brewster from the uh, State Fair. Thank you very much, Speaker Jones, Chair Kaiser, Vice Chair Washington, and distinguished committee members. We thank you for your service to all of Maryland and to all Marylanders. I am Gary Brewster, the chairman of your Maryland State Fair. We're a 501c3 nonprofit led by volunteers and host 2 million people a, a year on our campus. To give you an example of things that we've done of late, uh, during the coronavirus pandemic. We were the first location in all of Maryland to offer free coronavirus testing uh, without the need of a doctor's note or appointment. We've hosted the pop-up food markets and the particularly hard hit Latino and immigrant community. We had the Amigos of Baltimore County and For My City on campus for food drives. We host the American Red Cross blood drives, emergency management vehicles. And when the state veterinarian contacted us and said, listen, 
we're getting farmers who are getting sick and can't take care of their livestock. We said, bring them to the state fair, we'll take care of them. We're also hosting jury selection process, free flu vaccinations, and of course, thousands of coronavirus vaccinations now as well. It's thanks to your leadership that we're able to do all these things. Now, with regard to sports wagering, the fairgrounds is very well positioned to bring money in from Pennsylvania and to keep Maryland dollars in Maryland. According to the independent uh, Johnson Consulting Group, if the fairgrounds were brought up to date, we would generate an extra 55 to $60 million a year in economic impact for the state of Maryland. To, to do so, uh, we need a long-term revenue stream to address our critical capital needs. The Baltimore County House and Senate delegations have unanimously voted in favor of the state fairgrounds getting this. Our 30 member board of directors has as well. A broad based community group of 50 surrounding neighborhood associations voted in favor of our Maryland State Fair getting this because they recognize the value of our services. We've proven our ability to do it by having the number one OTB in the state of Maryland. And we do have live thoroughbred horse racing on our campus as well. In addition to hosting emergency responders from out of state when we have storm emergencies and veterans organizations and school children, we have more than 10,000 youth playing sports in our, our field. Just in closing, I'd like to close just on a personal note uh, because I've been so moved by the, the speaker's effort and your efforts to address minority participation. For those that, that don't know, my father was the only Democratic United States Senator south of the Mason-Dixon line that co-sponsored both the Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65, Fair Housing Act of 68. It was when he defeated racist, Alabama Governor George Wallace in the 64 uh, presidential primary and Maryland's votes then went to Lyndon Johnson, of course. That's when the filibuster broke on the 64 Civil Rights Act. We at the Maryland State Fair are passionate about this issue and, and we commend you for your service and for your leadership. And we look forward to continuing to make you proud. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brewster. And I'll take a few more people before we uh, uh, take another round of questions. We'll go next to Michael Arrington. Mr. Arrington, are you here? Good afternoon, Madam Speaker. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Okay, yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman uh, and uh, 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 members of the committee. For the record, my name is Michael Arrington. My company is Capital Connections, and I'm here today in support of House Bill 940, put forth by our distinguished speaker, the Honorable Adrian Jones. Um, a lot of points have been made, and I don't want to be redundant. I'll try to be quick. But I do wish to point out there are a few improvements I believe that could be uh, made to this legislation. And my recommendations are focused towards making certain that the small and minority business community has an opportunity to, for substantial ownership in these licenses. Uh, as, as Delegate Barnes has stated and many others have stated, uh, historically that the model we've used in Maryland hasn't worked in terms of accomplishing that. And the casino industry and the medical cannabis industry is a great example. In those scenarios, big businesses and the wealthiest amongst us had the opportunity. Uh, and the smaller base community businesses and minority businesses were rendered pretty much non-existent. This shouldn't happen in Maryland. And I think this body should be very purposeful and intent on creating opportunities that distribute wealth throughout all levels of our community. You should formulate a practice that is in the best interest of, of, of the grassroots uh, uh, even. So the idea of only casinos and racetracks and pro team sports uh, partnering with minority investors will fail at this task. Even limit it to just five uh, entities uh, does that. So uh, let's make it happen uh, in a better fashion this time. Uh, so with that commentary, let me tell you what my recommendations are. Uh, my client is Evergreen Information Technology, and they are world-class and have 30 years of past performance in the field of IT security, system integration, and managed networks. As a layperson, I imagine that all of these components are necessary in a sports betting fantasy and fantasy competition operation. Because there are an abundance of uh, minority IT firms throughout the state of Maryland, that might be a good place to start in terms of looking for qualified entities uh, to be uh, uh, substantial owners. Secondly, please don't allow, as I said earlier, 
please don't allow there to be just a few entities that have these licenses. Uh, there's no reason to limit it to just even, even the sports teams, the stadium owners, uh, casinos and racetracks, and five physical entities. Uh, you should allow for smaller base community venues such as established bingo halls, sports bars, and even lodges. Don't buy into the argument that limiting the amount of venues to just a big existing gaming establishments uh, is what's best for the state. That's monopolistic, it's exclusive, and it flies in the face of our free enterprise system. Maryland made that mistake previously. There's no valid argument that a number of venues will have an adverse impact on the revenue to the state. When you think it's a bogus claim, when you think about the amount of uh, people who sell lottery tickets and keno tickets, they're almost on every corner. Now I'm not advocating that we have these uh, license holders on every corner, but the state's gonna get its revenue, whether it's five additional physical location, locations with the casinos, racetracks and stadiums, or whether it's 20. So with that, with that uh, being said, uh, Madam Chair, I'd uh, like to ask that the committee move favorable on this bill, but please take into consideration how important it is to make sure that uh, small businesses and minority businesses have the opportunity to participate uh, at a very viable and substantial level uh, in this wealth creating opportunity that you're about to legislate uh, after your deliberations. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Harrington. It sounds like you have suggested amendments though you signed up as favorable and not favorable with amendments. So if you could uh, make sure you send to us what you're particularly looking at, because uh, I believe that Speaker Jones's bill uh, took a very expansive uh, approach to making sure we did the right thing for minority and women owned businesses. Um, Mr. Cashman, also from the fair. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Madam Chairman and the rest of the committee. Um, I'm Andy Cashman, I'm the general manager of the Maryland State Fair. And um, I, you've heard some great things are happening here. The, the fair is being used in this time of pandemic with the county um, health department doing testing and, and uh, vaccines and blood drives and food drives. But um, we really um, have a, a great location, a great facility here. And um, it's 140 years old. And, um, you know, um, we have kept up with a lot of great things, but there's a lot of... Uh, capital improvements and things that we could certainly uh, use the um, sports betting money to, to help us to survive and to improve our facility and, and grounds. And it's everything from roofs to painting to uh, steel to parking lots. Uh, we have pipes and things that are underground that's, uh, they're older, they're um, breaking in the middle of the parking lot. And, and um, so we're, we are really working hard to um, keep the um, facility up to date. We, um, we have so many great rentals and events here, but with things the way they are now, we, we've lost that income. We lost our fare last year, the income from our fare. Um, and, it, you know, we're hoping we can return and, and get that back this year. But um, things are, um, <clears throat> are, we're surviving and we're getting along, but it's been tough and uh, we're working very hard to uh, keep things going. Uh, we have sports events in the infields for uh, youth and lacrosse. Uh, they're usually around 10,000 kids over the uh, summer that are here. Of course, those numbers are way off because of the pandemic, but we are trying <clears throat> to uh, maintain and, and keep things in um, order and keep the uh, our business uh, um, moving along. Um, we are really active in trying to uh, make sure that folks um, are able to get here and do what they need to do and, and supply the community and the, um, uh, our county and the state with all the great things we do for uh, everything from the um, agriculture end to the educational end to the shows and things. So I have a written testimony and um, I just wanted you to, to know that we're in support of uh, House Bill 940 and hope you will return a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cashman. And then uh, just one more before a round of questions and we'll take Steve Wise. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Steve Wise here today with Bally's Corporation, which uh, as you may know, uh, operates casinos in a number of states, but also uh, is an online operator in nine states. We have submitted our written testimony. So you have that 
Um, but our interest lies in the mobile licenses that uh, have been discussed already. And we would encourage the committee to, to retain that provision of the bill as this moves through the process. Uh, there was information presented yesterday on a Senate work group from DLS, which indicated all of the states that have more recently adopted uh, mobile or have adopted sports betting have really increased the mobile presence as they've done that. And that seems to be the trend among the states adopting sports betting uh, to include broader uh, aspects of the sports betting and as included in the bill this year that the speaker has introduced and we appreciate her efforts. So uh, Bally's is very much interested in participating in the mobile aspect of the program and fully supports the minority participation provisions that have been discussed uh, today during the hearing. Uh, we would very much like to participate in any work group or subcommittee uh, activity on this bill and I am happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wise. Uh, I will start with a question for you, Mr. Wise. In supporting the uh, MBE provisions, how is Bailey looking to incorporate that into their model of if they were to get an online license? I uh, appreciate the question. And um, one of the things that uh, I intend to provide them with, because this has come up in the last two days in different discussions, is the framework that was set out under the Medical Cannabis Commission um, and, and I'm going to give them an opportunity to analyze that and that might give us a little bit more feedback, but, um, you know, I think, I think the thinking is that we would certainly entertain opportunities for, for equity, uh, involvement and certainly the standard MBE, um, uh, provisions that are in the bill now. Okay. It's just, I know that some companies have already kind of, uh, made, made the plan and that's what I was trying to get at, but we do have yeah. other here. Uh, Delegate Wilkins. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to everyone who has testified so far today. My question is for the folks at the State Fair. I just wanted to better understand this is a new industry, of course, for us all and especially for the public. In terms of the license, can you share more about what that looks like for someone um, who's interacting with the State Fair and on your grounds? What, what would that actually look like for people? Sure. The, the Maryland State Fair and Agricultural Society is owned by all of the people of Maryland as a nonprofit. And we've been there 140 years and, and we're run by a 30 member board of directors. All of us are volunteer. I appear before you as a, as a volunteer. And so whatever money is earned goes back to the people of the state of Maryland. For purposes of the licensing, um, we do have uh, thoroughbred horse racing at the State Fair during the State Fair race meet. And the Maryland Racing Commission regulates us and, and vetted us in order for us to have that, that uh, horse racing license. For purposes of sports wagering, however, we would set up a, a for-profit subsidiary that would be taxed so that Maryland gets all of its revenue, the federal government gets all of its revenue. And what's left over after all of the taxation then would revert to the parent corporation, which is the nonprofit Maryland State Fair. So again, it all, you remove, when you have a nonprofit, you remove greed from the equation because we're all volunteers and we can't have a profit. The money goes right back to upgrading the facilities and providing services to Marylanders. Thank you, so quick follow-up. So would that be like building out a particular room or space on your, on your grounds? Yeah. What, would it, what yeah. would it actually physically be? Yes, yeah, so at, at the Maryland State Fairgrounds, we have 42 buildings. The biggest is the grandstand and, and community center. And uh, on the concourse, the, the main level of that, we currently have the OTB, uh, which has been very successful. Uh, one of the reasons, because we're getting so many Pennsylvania dollars coming down 83. Uh, then we also have Nick's Grandstand Grill and Restaurant right next to it. And then on the third area of that main concourse would be a, a hall that would be uh, constructed for, for the physical part of the sports wagering uh, component at the state fairgrounds, all on that concourse level of the grandstand and community center. And, and again, we did get the neighborhoods involved in this and, and the 50 surrounding neighborhoods like that location and in fact wanted it at that location. Um, and so that's where it would be. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Wilkins. Delegate Guyton. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Mr. Brewster, Mr. Cashman, uh, for being here on behalf of our state fair in District 42B. I want to thank the speaker, Delegate Ebersol, Delegate Lukey, Delegate uh, Barnes for bringing this bill. It is very complicated, as, as I know from my experience on the um, on the gaming subcommittee the past few years. I just want to double check with the wonderful folks from the State Fair. We've been advocating both for support for the State Fair through this committee for the past three years, but also that the State Fair really wants to be able to be a part of the support for the, the curve and the blueprint um, for Maryland's future. I want to make sure that Mr. Brewster and Mr. Cashman are comfortable with this bill as it stands that the state fair is well represented and um, and make sure there's no there are no changes or amendments that need to be made. Yes, so with, with reference to education, uh, we're passionate about that as well. Uh, again, I, I spent a good part of my career, not only in the House of Delegates as a member, but I was also a Baltimore County public school teacher for many years. And, and uh, I have a strong commitment and passion for education and I'm delighted uh, that, that the money from this legislation will go to that. And I would point out that I think Maryland will get the most money for uh, education from the various locations from the Maryland State Fair because of our location. We've proven we're the number one OTV in the state of Maryland because we have a racetrack, because we have 2 million people a year on campus and because uh, we're all volunteers. So, so there's no pay to us, no greed. It goes right back to Maryland. So I think Maryland gets its best bang for the buck by licensing the Maryland State Fairgrounds. Thank you, Delegate Guyton. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions for, uh, for these first four people? We'll, we'll take the uh, next group again, not really a panel, just as they signed up. Uh, we next have Donna Myers, also from the State Fair. And if I had noticed that sooner, I might've done that differently, but Donna Myers. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Thank you, Chair Kaiser and the committee. And I'll just piggyback a little bit more on the information that Gary and Andy um, provided for you and probably gonna emphasize, we talk about our infrastructure and how the needs are there, but um, we also do a lot for education and with additional funding, we can continue to grow that. Um, in the last, in the 142 year history, we have uh, Beginnings as a fair, which in the beginning was a social gathering for farmers, homemakers, 4-H and FFA members to showcase their livestock, their home goods, and also to provide um, entertainment for fairgoers. Now, we still provide that platform, but we continue to evolve and expand to ensure opportunities for all Marylanders to either participate or be educated on the importance of agriculture and how it affects every aspect of their lives. The fair continues to work toward following its mission statement, which is providing agriculture and nature-based education on a year-round basis through partnerships, community engagements, and development of both temporary and permanent exhibits, in addition to providing scholarships for our youth. The fair has developed opportunities such as the U-Learn Center, where youth and their families come and can interactively see and learn about science behind food production, GS. GPS technology used in farming, watch a calf or piglet be born in our birthing center or visit horse land that gives opportunity for the children to learn about um, horse and ponies engage in horse related activities. We're most excited right now in the planning stages to make our nature play space, which was located right next to a horse uh, land if you were to attend our fair in the last few years. And that will be a year round activity on the north end of the campus that will provide children the opportunity to learn and play in a natural setting and with natural materials. Sports betting will give us the ability to further develop opportunities for our youth to, on a more year round basis, to learn about local agriculture and the benefits to Maryland through open space and local produce food. We would continue to develop our relationships that we have started with area schools, providing opportunities for hands-on agriculture through a green that school children could use to learn about gardening and growing plants, plants sorry, as part of their course. So um, because we are a nonprofit, uh, all the benefits, as Gary so well stated, goes right back to Marylanders, and we could sh uh, sh share and just continue on our mission that um, we're very proud of and, and hope to be able to continue for 
at least another 142 years. So thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you, Ms. Myers. Uh, we'll next go to Randy Cohen. Mr. Cohen, are you here? All right, looking through, I don't see him. I will, I will ask again after a couple other names, Charles Hopkins. Good afternoon, Speaker Jones, Madam Chair, and distinguished members of this committee. My name is Charles Hopkins. I am president and CEO of RMD Holdings LLC, a resident Maryland firm certified in the state as a minority business enterprise. I come before you today in support of HB 940 and to thank the leadership of the House, this committee, and the Maryland Legislative Black Caucus for their hard work in ensuring the inclusion of MBEs and the equity and ownership of mobile sports betting licenses in Maryland. The urgency of MBE license inclusion is hastened by the glaring examples today of economic disparities within the black community. The foresight of this noble committee a year ago to ensure minority business inclusion was properly analyzed prior to any state procured licensure for sports betting has enabled firms like mine to have a fighting chance to be considered within this new business paradigm. As a longtime MBE and native son of Maryland, I am personally grateful for the resolve shown that minority firms will be able to compete fairly for this opportunity. Consequently, the prospective partnerships that may arise between MBE firms and other stakeholder firms will strengthen the competitive offerings the state will receive from sports betting licensees. With the retraction of in-person gambling due to COVID, ensuring robust mobile sports betting is a critical priority for Maryland gambling revenue a portion of which is remitted in the form of tax receipts directly back into our communities and supporting local priorities, such as our public schools. As with other states, utilizing dynamic partnerships between minority firms and non-casino mobile sports betting platforms will further optimize financial returns to the state and promote its long held principle of fair and inclusive procurement and licensure procedures. Thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hopkins. Uh, we next have Christian Good. Uh, good afternoon, Chairwoman Kaiser, Vice Chairman Washington, and members of the committee. Um, also, uh, Speaker uh, Jones. My name is Christian Good. I'm the CEO of IG Acquisition Corporation. I come before you today urging a favorable report on House Bill 940. First, I'd like to commend the speaker on drafting perhaps the most respectful proposed legislation in the area that I've seen to date. Not only does it offer a new opportunity, uh, for traditional casinos, but by allowing them to open sports betting lodges, but it also allows the state to maximize the fiscal opportunity for the state by creating new and robust industry, um, mobile sports wagering. Authorizing dedicated mobile sports wagering license in a manner proposed in this bill is the best way for the state to maximize tax revenue and meet its goal of uh, goals of inclusivity and minority participation as the framework provides three important things. Upfront license fees and periodic renewals, new revenue streams for the state Thanks. and more opportunity for new people, including minority owned businesses. Um, I have 20 years in, in the gaming space. I've worked for large resorts and small resorts alike, lived in Maryland while I worked for a, a casino company and can tell you firsthand that minority businesses often don't get a fair shake. And I think this bill goes a long way to doing that. Um, mobile wagering has been growing steadily over the past couple of years, but has grown exponentially as a result of the current pandemic. And as many customers are reluctant to physical, visit a physical sports book to place wagers, they're more than happy to engage on their personal device to do so. Just to give you some perspective, last month in Pennsylvania, 94% of the sports wagers uh, went through online operators, not through physical bricks and mortar facilities. Why is the number so high? Because there's already healthy competition in those jurisdictions, uh, particularly Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and others alike, which is good for the gaming public, but most importantly, it's good for tax revenue generation. As the market grows and more people compete for those licenses and those business, you have a much more robust and you have much more market penetration, ultimately generating enhanced tax revenues. Several states uh, have more than 10 online operators that you've proposed here. I think we would support and I think the what's best for the state of Maryland is to support as many operators as possible in order to develop the most robust market. 
you know, there's reported that Virginia has received 25 applications for their 12 mobile sports wagering license. I think Maryland will receive more than that, actually. Mobile licenses are means to set our means and you provide people seats at the table for diverse entities to participate and for new people to get involved in a growing industry. It's not just for the established casinos. Again, I'd like to reiterate my support for House Bill 940. Uh, I think the framework has been well thought out. It will lead to a robust sports wagering industry within the state of Maryland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Good. I'll try one more time with Mr. Cohen. Thank you. Madam Chair, present. Apology for the screen failure. I am inept at this computer. Uh, I am from Frederick, Maryland, and we have long shots. We will come right to the point where we're in very much support of the bill. Uh, our delegation was in support of the bill. Uh, we are 100% in favor of the minority inclusion. Uh, in fact, this will be tremendous for you. Long shots is already owned 70% by women. The next thing I'd like to point out is our location is very interesting in Frederick. We, we've had times where on Saturdays, we would have a robust business. College football came along and our business ended up in Charlestown. We lost incredible tax dollars for the state and for our educational uh, facilities that we support with scholarships. In our company, we have three hotels at this point. Each one has a minority GM. I think that's important to let you know that. Uh, we've supported that forever. We have the lottery at Long Shots. And uh, we want to point out a couple more things. New Jersey has mobile sports betting, as you know. They have now approved that their mobile sports betting can be used anywhere in the United States. So we need to find a way to geofence off, if possible, some of these other mobile units from our state. The second thing that I'd like to point out here is if you have five locations, five class Bs that are approved, and you already have the class A's appointed for the tracks and the casinos, there are exactly five OTBs that are not affiliated with a track or casino there should be a thought process on how it's handled where the dilution of the gambling in the jurisdiction would wipe out certain businesses if it's taken from an OTB and put in another location. Does that benefit the whole state? Does that benefit uh, the education? Not really. So there should be another way to consider how that could be done either by having the OTP include minority participation or in our case, we already have it. The next thing I'd like to point out is the study that, that was mentioned earlier, the NERC study. That's, a, that's a one that was published and sent out. It promotes both minority and women to participate in this bill. That's it for me. I just wanted to point these things out in brief. And again, apologize. I have no idea how to work the camera on this computer. Uh, no problem. Um, does anyone have any questions for uh, Ms. Myers, Mr. Cohen, Mr. Hopkins, or Mr. Good? All right, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for being part of the process. I'll go to the next few names on the list. We have Thomas Kelso from the Maryland Stadium Authority. Hey, good afternoon, uh, Madam Speaker, Chair Kaiser, Vice Chair Washington, and members of the Ways and Means Committee. 
I am Thomas Kelso and I am chairman of the Maryland Stadium Authority. And I really appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of HB 940 with amendments. For clarity, I want to be clear that I am speaking on behalf of the authority and not for any of the professional sports teams in Maryland who do an excellent job of speaking for themselves. The amendment the authority recommends is to allow all professional sports teams in Maryland to have sports gaming licenses, both bricks and mortar and digital, depending on what best fits their business models. Sports gaming is another form of entertainment and there is great competition for the entertainment dollar. If the professional sports teams in Maryland do not have sports gaming licenses, fans who might otherwise attend games live and in person may go to other facilities that do have sports gaming licenses, thereby depriving the professional sports teams of revenues from ticket sales as well as concessions. If fans do not attend games, it has a direct effect, effect economically on the MSA, the city and the state through de decreased ticket tax revenues, decreased rents, decreased parking revenues and decreased tax collections. Likewise, it would mean fewer fans patronizing surrounding businesses. It would be highly unlikely that someone attending a game would stop first at a casino to place their bet and then get back in their car and drive to the stadium and attend a game. In addition, the teams that play at Camden Yard stadiums should not be at a disadvantage to teams playing in other parts of Maryland and in DC. The Nationals already have a sports betting license for their stadium and the Washington football team already appears to qualify under the bill as drafted. I also note that the Washington football team already has a license in Virginia. Likewise, the teams that play in Maryland should not be disadvantaged over teams that play in cities and states where sports teams will have sports gaming licenses like DC and Chicago, as well as other states and cities with sports gaming legislation pending that would allow professional sports teams to have sports gaming licenses. If the teams in Baltimore do not have licenses, it is just one more reason why the teams that play in a smaller sports market like ours cannot compete with teams in larger markets, which could certainly affect the long-term viability of the teams that play in the Camden Yards sports complex. Professional sports- Thank you, Mr. Mr. Kelso, the three minutes are up. Okay. Would you have a statement to wrap things up? I, I, I would like for you to consider the fact that in horse racing, um, the horsemen and the track owners share in all betting, regardless of where it takes place through the paramutual pool. Um, in casino gaming, the casino operators bear all the costs and they um, get all the returns. But here okay, in- Mr. Kelso? Yeah. Mr. Kelso, again, we, we do have your written testimony. We need you to summarize as the three minutes has been up. I just wanted to, to finalize by saying that um, in sports gaming, the people who were actually putting on the events, bearing all the costs and the risks, um, would not be able to share in it unless they can actually have a license. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Tony Jones. Good afternoon, Speaker Jones, Chairwoman Kaiser, and distinguished members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Tony Jones, Chief Strategy Officer for Delmar Technologies and an equity owner of Riverboat on the Potomac. The Riverboat is an off-track betting parlor located in Charles County, but our position is very unique. Although our front door faces Colonial Beach, Virginia, our building is located on the Potomac River. So while we pay Maryland business taxes and our betting revenues flow back through Maryland, over 90% of our patrons are Virginia residents. Nearly 100 years ago, the Riverboat was one of many Maryland casinos that took advantage of the Potomac River border. Today, we are the only building left from that era. 
When we lost slot machines, we became a lottery retailer. And then satellite simulcast betting facility. Operating a standalone sports business betting license would be for us the next natural and critically important step. Right now, the General Assembly has the unique opportunity to provide equity to groups who have historically been excluded from participating in multi-million and even billion dollar markets. The Riverboat team is proudly diverse, African-American and immigrants. So while we appreciate the steps that this bill has taken to address minority equity and inclusion, we believe that more can be done to ensure that MBEs have a fair and impartial place at the table. We feel that we have the expertise and actively participate in this market to actively participate in this market and create for us true generational wealth. Allowing an MBE such as the Riverboat to operate a standalone mobile sports betting license would signal to the nation that our state is serious about minority, inclu minority inclusion and would also help restore one of our country's most historical gaming sites right here in Merlin. I thank you for your time and we support the bill. All right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we next have John Lavoy. Right here, thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker, Madam Chairwoman, uh, I'm a representative of the Southern Maryland Blue Crabs, a minor league professional baseball team in Waldorf, Charles County as well. Uh, and we are part of a coalition that we've created with the Hagerstown professional minor league baseball team as well. Our team, the Southern Maryland Blue Crabs, is a partner league of major league baseball. We have an ideal facility to host a potential bricks and mortar license, as well as a mobile license. And reading the original bill, we were disappointed that it seemed that between the six casinos and the three racetracks, it would be very difficult for small operators such as ours or Mr. Jones or the, uh, the fairground or others to have inclusion in this equity from both a geographic standpoint, like was the case in the medical cannabis bill, as well as from an equity inclusion standpoint of women and minority owned businesses. Uh, we would absolutely partner with several MBEs if this were possible uh, for the Southern Maryland Blue Crabs. And we would be looking at this to a large extent like the fairgrounds in order to keep professional minor league baseball viable in Charles County and all of Southern Maryland and to use that income stream to keep the ballpark up, improved and uh, ahead of the curve as far as future capital expenditures and other improvements. So we would uh, support the bill, be in favor of the bill with amendments and like Delegate Barnes and others have said, uh, Mr. Hopkins, we really, uh, appreciate your consideration of this and would stress that equity both geographically for some of the smaller uh, areas and venues, not just Prince George's County, not just Baltimore City, which dominate those lottery revenues, but some of the smaller regions and operators who could pull in a lot of people geographically and still be very economically relevant. Happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you so much. We'll take one more person, then, and we do have a few people waiting for some questions. Next person is Winston D. Ladabuder. And sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. No problem at all. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Speaker Jones, Vice Chair Washington, and distinguished members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Winston D. Ladabuder, and I'm the President and CEO of Delmont Technologies, DTI for short and an equity owner of the Riverboat on the Potomac. I am proud to say that I received my undergraduate and graduate degrees from our local Bowie State University. My firm, DTI, is a certified MBE located in Baltimore. I would like to note that our firm has been incorporated in Maryland since 2002, and in fact certified by the Maryland Department of Transportation for over 15 years. My point is that we are true Maryland MBEs and not just going through the process of applying for certification. DTI is a well-established information technology entity having done work with both the federal government as well as the state of Maryland. Our strengths include a broad realm of technology services as well as cybersecurity, which of course includes ensuring a broad range of data protection, 
and specifically in regards to sports gaming, making certain that all participants personally identifiable information is protected. We feel the knowledge to navigate these areas are crucial in the online gaming space. We are confident that our partnership with the Riverboat is one of technological merit and not just a name on a paper. Last session, the Riverboat was included in the second to final version of SB4. We are asking today for support that would qualify the Riverboat for a standalone so that Maryland may provide a blueprint to other states looking to provide real MBE equity in the sports betting market. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, we do have a, a few questions. I'll just direct the first question to the last gentleman who spoke. Are you talking about that as an OTB that you're talking about? Um, we're, we're talking about as a, um, a, a standalone license. We're currently um, in, in, in OTB, but we'd like the, um, the essentially the mobile, the mobile betting license in a standalone overall license. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, to members, we do have uh, a few hands up on this. I'll start with uh, Delegate Lutke. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Mr. Kelso, I have a couple questions for you, if, if you could. Um, I just want to uh, make sure I understand. So are, are you speaking on behalf of the the stadium authority or the the Orioles and the Ravens? I'm definitely just speaking on uh, the part of the authority. Okay, are you are you advocating for the authority itself to own the license, or or uh, what what's the ask? Well, the ask is is that um, we would like for the tenants of the authority uh, to be eligible for licenses. Okay, so not not the not the authority itself. Not the authority itself. Okay, just just one final question: Did the stadium authority board take a take a position on this issue? Have they have they voted on this issue? No. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Delegate Luthi. Um, next, we have uh, Delegate Feldmark. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, my question actually sort of follows along, um, Mr. Kelso. If you could help me understand. Um, so if I'm reading the bill correctly, it does allow for sports wagering at one of the stadiums or e either or both of the stadiums. Um, but so I'm trying to understand the, uh, the significance of the team actually being the licensee. I, I understand the synergy around having fans have the ability to, to place bets at the stadium, but can you help me understand why it's important for the team itself to be the licensee? Well, I think the teams would probably be better um, at explaining, you know, their relative positions as, as to why they believe that they should have licenses. But um, without a bricks and mortar license, um, is, is that people who want to bet uh, at a bricks and mortar location would not be able to do it if the team did not have a bricks and mortar license at Camden Yards. Somebody would have to go to another facility to do, um, to bet at a bricks and mortar location. Well, well maybe, uh, maybe someone else can clarify, but I, I believe they would be able to have betting at the stadium. It just wouldn't necessarily be the team that was the licensee. So if, if another licensee was able to provide the opportunity for fans to place bets at the stadium, would that meet the authorities, the stadium authorities concerns? Um, well, I mean, I didn't read the bill that way. So I'll have to go back and read the bill. You know, I thought that, um, you know, people were precluded from licenses within 10 miles. And so assuming the Horseshoe Casino would have a license is, is that that would preclude Camden Yards from having a license. But I, I believe the Horseshoe as a licensee could provide for bets to be placed at the stadium. So you could well, still could. have on-site betting, but well, the licensee they, would be. Well, that they could, um, except that each stadium is leased by the authority uh, to the teams. So that um, Horseshoe and a team or teams would have to negotiate some type of an arrangement that was satisfactory to the team, the authority would have no 
um, uh, you know, way to uh, affect that one way or the other. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Delegate Buckle? Uh, that was that was somewhat of my line of questioning, Mr. Kelso. It's, it's nice to see you. Is that, you know, there's section, it's called 9 yeah. 9 of the bill. And I think perhaps the committee can work through this and better define who would be eligible uh, to operate a, a license, a brick and mortar operation, so to speak, within the stadiums. Would it, my sense of the stadium authority's position, your position at least as the chair that you're articulating for them today, is that you think it's important from a competitive perspective to allow to have some type of brick and mortar operation within at least one, if not both, of the downtown Baltimore sports stadium. Is that a fair summarization of it, or is there something more to it? No, that, 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 that's close. Um, you know, what, what, what the authority is most concerned about is the fear that um, people don't come to the stadium to watch the games. And so if you think about going back to 2002, when the Nationals moved to Washington, is, is that the Masson settlement, that might have satisfied the Nationals and it might have satisfied Major League Baseball and it might have satisfied the Orioles. But the state of Maryland lost all the fan attendance as people that were Nash became Nationals fans stopped coming to Baltimore. So we only have an economic interest in people actually coming to the stadium the games. in order to, to go to games, right? If they don't come, then, you know, the huge investment that we have, uh, the state has, um, you know, we can't get the returns that, you know, we're all looking for. So we're just cannibalizing one form of entertainment for another if we can't get people to come to the stadium. And, and it would be your position that it would help uh, that in-game experience, it would help to keep people coming who say, hey, I, I want to come and watch the Orioles or the Ravens, but while I'm here, I'd also like to place wagers. You think that it would increase the, the participation and the attendance levels to have some type of facility on site for that, that activity? Is that the bottom line of it? Um, yes, um, and, but what better way to grow the pie <laughs> than to be able to market directly to the hundreds of thousands of people a year that come to Oriole Park and M&T Bank Stadium and try to grow the pie of, um, of sports gamers, sports gamblers. Um, and it's not just game bets, but it's proposition bets. So the bets that are going on during the game, um, which are focused on the game that people are actually watching, that is really best done live at the game as long as um, it can be done. Right, done within certain parameters for, uh, you know, not, not involving any type of uh, fraudulent gaming, which there's a lot of regulations about and methods. That, that's great. I, I really appreciate your perspective on that and that makes some sense to me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. We do have a couple more questions, but before that, uh, Mr. Kelso, I would direct you to section 91E09. Uh, pages 21 and 22 of the bill, um, A1, Roman 4, uh, the question that Delegate Feldmark asked you, uh, uh, our lawyer has uh, suggested that she is correct. So to, uh, based on the question she asked you, so if you can take a look at that provision again in 91E09, uh, we will take additional questions. Uh, Delegate Ebersole? No, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, it was a clarification. You just took care of it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Delegate Wilkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is for my friends associated with the Riverboat. Very much appreciate all of your financial mm -hmm. contributions to the state. Um, and I wanted to unpack and hear more from you around in terms of this bill, um, what you feel is needed to ensure the, the full participation in terms of you all being a, a minority business? I'll take that question, delegate. And thank you so much for, for your support. Um, there's, there's, there's some specific matters that uh, gave us concern and it's centered around the few number of mobile licenses we believe, as you've heard already on this on this hearing, uh, there has to be more than that because more license, more um, com uh, competition, and more revenue back to the state. 
So we believe that the number of mobile license has to really climb up. Our major concern is that with six casinos and two or three horse tracks, if there's only 10 mobile licenses, one would have to believe that um, those casinos will get a mobile license. One would have to believe almost that the three or two or three racetracks will get a license. Then you'd have the minority firms fighting amongst one another for a very small piece of the pie. And that's not what I think the state wants to, wants to have happen with regard to um, the gaming sports betting industry. So we're advocating for multiple mobile licenses. Um, just so you know, our facility down, at, uh, down in Charles County um, in its 50, I'm sorry, in its 70 years of operation, quite frankly, uh, has been destroyed twice. So brick and mortar is not gonna work for us. It was destroyed by fire and a second, in a second round with um, hurricane. So we're, we were able to rebuild, but brick and mortar license is not for us a, a game changing or a um, generationally uh, appropriate opportunity for um, uh, wealth. So we're, we're seeking something greater than the mobile license number that's currently on the books. And we believe we should qualify for one, given the fact that we are a completely ethnically minority ethnically comprised group. We're African-Americans and we're immigrants. All right, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, more questions, Delegate Barnes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Mr. Jones, I, I'm, I'm listening to you. You're saying that you believe that the number of mobile licenses should be increased. And what would you think is a fair number that it is increased to? Well, I was on the, um, the work group yesterday held by um, Senator Zucker, and there was a gentleman who came on who had some very strong statistics about the fact that the more mobile license, the more um, the more competition, and the more revenue back to the state. Um, he felt that um, at least, I think he said it was more than ten. I think right now we're talking about five. And I, the, the company's name was IDEA. I just don't have the detail, but. You know, someone who might have been in that Senator um, Griffin, I think, was probably in that in that in that um, hearing yesterday on, on Wednesday. Yesterday, well, so right now the bill states ten. So you're saying we should increase it to fifteen? Um, I think you need to go north of you need to go you need to go almost to twenty because my 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 expectation, um, delegate, is that the casinos and the tracks going to get the first eight. Okay. So my point is that whatever is left will be relegated to I those. Understand. I understand. Okay. I, I okay. just wanted your perspective. Yeah. yeah. Not, I, just, I, I heard you several times say it should be increased. I was just curious as to what number do you believe that it should be increased yeah. to? That's, we've talked, our, our team and um, our lobbies, we've talked about double that number. All right. Thank 20 you. 20 versus 10. Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chief. Thank you All for right. asking, sir. Uh, Thank you for those questions. We'll uh, continue to the um, the next one and a half pages of uh, people testifying. We'll next go with Frank Boston. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Frank Boston III, uh, and I'm here on behalf of the Maryland State Fair, favorable with amendments. I will be very brief so that we can get through to the next page and a half. The, by way of disclosure, I also represent FanDuel and DraftKings. The representatives from those companies will be testifying after me. Um, on behalf of the State Fair, the First Amendment, uh, Gary already mentioned it in questioning. Um, it's, it's on page eight, line 23. Um, and it's basically, we are adding the word subsidiary. <clears throat> this allows us to be set up for a non, to be set up for a for-profit uh, company so that we can pay taxes. Uh, and then after all of the expenses are paid, everything will revert back to the nonprofit for the, uh, you know, the repairs that were uh, forementioned earlier. Uh, the OTB is already set up the same way and language, corrective language needs to be put in the bill so that uh, we could do the same with sports betting. The second amendment uh, is just a name change. It's on page 21. Um, lines 19 through 20. Uh, it basically says a uh, racetrack located uh, at Timonium. 
Timonium is an area and we would just insert language to say uh, <clears throat> at the Maryland State Fair and Agricultural Society in Timonium. Those would be the only technical changes just to make it clear that where the license was going in Timonium. And that's my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Boston. Thank you for your conciseness. We next have Aaron Weinstock. Hello. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Aaron Weinstock and I'm a student attorney in the University of Maryland School of Law's Public Health Law Clinic. Today, I'm here to urge you to consider two amendments that would strengthen House Bill 940 by addressing the public health concerns associated with gambling addiction. First, the bill should be amended to promote responsible gambling programs. Second, the bill should contain a reporting requir requirement. Problem gambling is an addiction that an estimated 150,000 adult Marylanders currently face. Ensuring these Marylanders are able to get the help that they need is a simple, common sense measure for the legislature to take. First, House Bill 940 should be amended to promote responsible gambling programs among licensees. Responsible gambling programs protect the public by making a reasonable attempt to prevent harmful gambling addiction and to provide treatment for people who do become addicted. A good program should include training that teaches employees at sports betting facilities how to identify signs of problem gambling and how they can assist patrons in obtaining information about gambling addiction treatment programs. It should also include information about how licensees may responsibly advertise sports betting and how they can help to raise awareness of resources that are available to people who have gambling problems. Requiring licensees to develop responsible gambling programs makes them think about these issues and helps to create a safer community. Maryland's regulations already contain a similar requirement for video lottery facilities. So this amendment would be an excellent continuation of Maryland's commitment to responsible gambling practices. Secondly, this bill should contain a reporting requirement. Because sports betting has only been legal in most of the United States for a period of about three years, we do not have a great deal of information about the public health implications of sports betting. Requiring that the State Lottery and Gaming Control Commission provide regular information to the governor and the General Assembly would help all parties involved better understand the specific public health challenges that come from sports betting. A regular report could also be helpful when evaluating potential future changes to the statutory or regulatory schemes. Employing the strategies today will ensure that the state can reap the benefits of sports betting while also protecting local communities. I urge you to give this bill a favorable report with the proposed amendments. Thank you. All right, uh, next we have, or before we go to the next person, uh, I did wanna ask, uh, Ms. Weinstock, uh, were you a student of mine a few semesters ago at the University of Maryland in my women in leadership class? Yes, I was delegate. <laughs> All right, excellent. Good to see you. Glad to see you in law school now. Uh, next, we have uh, Malik Edwards. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Edwards. Can't hear you. Can you, still can't hear you, sir. Well, uh, you're unmuted. No. I have advice for you from staff. You might need to leave yeah. and reconnect the meeting. Uh, we're going to go to the next person. Uh, the suggestion is for you to exit and come back in, and that might work for you. We'll give that a try. We will come back to you. Uh, Mr. Gary Gunther. OK. <laughs> now, that, now you're there. OK, we hear you. Go ahead, Mr. Edwards. Oh, you hear me? You can hear me now? <laughs> Sorry, this, uh, this Zoom thing has gotten everybody. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Speaker, for allowing me to speak. My name is Malik Edwards. I'm Cohen Black LLC, a Maryland-based minority-owned company uh, that is seeking um, license 
Maryland either, uh, or at least an equity stake in one. And I'm speaking in support of House Bill 940 with amendments. Um, we're very supportive of the structure, uh, licensing structure with a class A, class B, and mobile licenses. Uh, we believe that this provides opportunity to appreciative of all of the delegates who have advocated for meaningful minority in this new industry. Um, I've heard mentions about um, not wanting to make the mistakes of the past, uh, recently with the uh, cannabis legislation. Um, so our, my, our first suggested amendment is that uh, this bill uh, also include language that was in uh, action in 2018 for the cannabis legislation. Um, that corrective action included language requiring disclosure of any minority, minority ownership of any applicant for a license. Uh, and that corrective action in the cannabis um, had a requirement that any um, awarding licenses actively seek diversity when, when making those awards. So uh, I, I, I request or suggest uh, adding that similar language to uh, House Bill 940. Um, the uh, second uh, is, uh, has also been articulated that is increasing licenses uh, available. Uh, the gentleman who spoke earlier, I think is correct. If you assume the casinos and tracks go after, uh, we assume that they will also go after mobile licenses and depending how you count them, that leaves one to three uh, for any um, class B or minority applicant to try to go after. And that's, that's um, I think, that won't accomplish the goals that have been articulated to increase the ownership. I also think that the 10 mile um, uh, radius, protective radius for the class A licenses is overbroad. Um, if, if you look at sort of the map of Baltimore City and, and the map surrounding the identified class A licenses, if the 10 mile stayed, there'd be no class Bs in Baltimore City, Southern Baltimore, major parts of Anne Arundel, Prince George's, Howard County, I think 10 miles is, 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 is too large. Um, I also, um, I think, so, so not to lose sight of Maryland's already existing participation, I don't want to um, sort of let the class A's off the hook, if you will. Uh, I think currently the bill says that licensees are required to uh, abide by the MBE and uh, that should read applicants. Uh, any application for any license, A, B, or Mr. Medical, Edwards, your three minutes has left. You have a, a sentence to share. Uh, there, there, that was, I was wrapping up that all applicants should be required to identify yeah, investors on the application phase, not after they get the license. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gary Gunter. Yes, good afternoon to the chair, vice chair, members of the committee and the speaker. I ask this committee to vote in favor of this bill with amendments to increase the number of online licenses to match the number of combined class A and class B licenses. Increasing the number of online licenses will not only ensure there are ample online licenses for class B license holders, who are the class most likely to have MBE participation, but it will also lead to a market that is able to more quickly mature and generate the jobs, taxes, and revenue that the state and its residents expect from this industry. Evidence of this can be seen in states like New Jersey that saw an expansion or lift in the industry with the addition of new online licenses or in the District of Columbia where the industry has struggled to get off the ground due to too few licenses. As mentioned many times already, it is also important that we implement stronger guide rails around the application process to ensure MBE participation as it will result in a more diverse, robust, and competitive sports wagering industry and economy for Maryland. I therefore would like to pass on the following recommendations for online licenses. First, require the Sports Wagering Application Review Commission to allocate a percentage of the application points on a sliding scale 
to only those applicants that achieve a material and specific level of MBE ownership. Two, require that up to half of the online licenses be made available for award to applicants that submit a completed application during an initial 30-day period reserved exclusively for applicants that have at least 51% MBE ownership and are majority owned by individuals that belong to the most disadvantaged ethnic minority groups in the state. And lastly, reduce the application and licensing fee for the first year by 50% for majority MBE owned licensees. These recommendations have already proven successful in increasing minority participation here in Maryland, as well as in other states like Michigan, where I have personally participated in competitive licensing processes for other emerging industries. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, uh, I'll, I will take uh, one more person before questions. Uh, Bruce Barriano. Mr. Barriano, you need to unmute. Yeah. There you uh, go. Can you hear me now? We can. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair, members of the House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, for the record, Bruce Barriano, I'm here in very strong support of this legislation. Commend the committee and, of course, the speaker uh, on this uh, issue. My client is um, a uh, off-track betting parlor in Frederick County, woman-owned. They have uh, they're in the final stages of their MBE uh, certification, and uh, they've been operating in the Clarion Hotel as we speak, and for the past several years. Mr. Barriano, you've, you've gone silent. Uh, in this endeavor, but in addition, I very much uh, think that uh, women-owned businesses should be given consideration as well. Uh, we would be asking that since we are a venue where there is uh, betting going on, uh, uh, very effective for Frederick County, uh, that we be included in the bill respectfully. There's a pending bill you're going to hear later on uh, in the future, uh, Madam Chair, uh, House Bill 1224, a uh, delegation bill of the Frederick County delegation uh, to establish that for Frederick County, probably the most logical and possible location for sports wagering um, uh, in Frederick County so that people don't go to West Virginia or to Pennsylvania. Uh, um, and those from Northern uh, Frederick County, uh, excuse me, uh, Montgomery County can easily get uh, to this location as well. So we commend you for your efforts. I will work very cooperatively and closely with the committee and uh, hope that the final product will uh, include uh, long shots in Frederick County. Thank you very much. Be very happy to answer any questions the committee may have. All right, thank you. If anyone has thank any you. questions for, for Mr. Boston, Ms. Weinstock, Mr. Edwards, Mr. Gunter, or Mr. Barriano. All right, thank you for no one asking uh, Ms. Weinstock if I was a good professor in the fall of 2016. All right, uh, if there's no other questions, we'll go on to the second to last grouping uh, in, in regards to questions, but we'll next take PJ Hogan. Thank you, um, Chair Kaiser, Vice Chair Washington, committee members. For the record, my name is PJ Hogan on behalf of Rocky Gap Casino. We have been operational as a casino since 2013, generating over $175 million for the state and investing over $46 million in capital improvements while providing between 350 and 500 jobs in an area of the state, as you all know, that faces severe economic challenges. We're very proud of our contracting with MBE firms. When, when we took over the license um, from the, the original awardee, they were at 1.37% MBE contracting. We have now eclipsed 23%. And we're very proud of that. As you also know, Rocky Gap is sandwiched between Pennsylvania, 2.5 miles to the north, and West Virginia, 10, only 10 miles uh, to the south. 
and over 50% of our players have been from outside of Maryland. The competition for sports betting is seen as an amenity. Uh, we feel it's critical to have this amenity to keep the casino viable and keep producing the significant revenues for the state. We also feel it's absolutely necessary to tie the on-site sports betting license to the mobile component, just as our surrounding competitor states have done. You have a three-page um, statement, I believe uh, Kerry Watson uh, is gonna present to you, uh, all six of the casinos expressing detailed um, uh, support uh, and suggested amendments uh, to the bill. Um, you know, Maryland was very slow to get into the casino gaming business, uh, but it has been very successful. And something that hasn't been mentioned yet today, the casinos in Maryland generate, I think it's almost now $800 million a year for the state, which has enabled you to, uh, uh, to make the educational um, commitments uh, that you've had. So while sports betting is a new opportunity, even the fiscal node and Mr. Medinica will tell you, it, it's, we're not talking a lot of money. Um, that's why we do really see it as an amenity. So you gotta be, think about uh, the impact it would have on the, the, uh, the casinos that you already have and already receiving money from. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hogan. Uh, we next have Zed Smith. Hi, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Zed Smith. I am a partner in and COO of the Cordish Companies, which owns a live casino and hotel, formerly Maryland Live. I might also add that I'm a native of Prince George's County and a proud graduate of Morgan State University. Uh, hotel Live Casino appreciates the opportunity to testify in favor of House Bill 940 with amendments to further expand gaming in Maryland with sports betting. In principle, we support the state's twin goals of establishing meaningful minority inclusion in sports betting while maximizing state tax revenue. As you may know, our, head, our company is headquartered in Maryland and we have been a top taxpayer for the state for the past 10 years. Since its inception, Maryland Live alone has generated over $2.5 billion in gaming tax revenue to the state. Uh, in my role as COO for the, last, for the past 20 years, I have been responsible to ensure that we engage in diversity, equity, and inclusion in every aspect of our company. And it's something that I've taken very seriously. We have been a leader with respect to diversity, equity, and inclusion in real estate, gaming, and, and, the, and the hospitality industry uh, for many years. Uh, we have the benefit as a company because we do operate uh, in multiple states to bring, to bring best practices to what we do in the area of diversity and inclusion. For instance, here in Maryland, uh, we employ over 3,000 Marylanders, of which 72% are minority, including as close to 60% of those uh, employees in the managerial level are, are minorities. We have also spent over $225 million uh, with MBE and WBE companies in the state. We are very proud to have facilitated the growth of many of our minority business partners, including facilitating networking among MBE and WBE companies in the state and providing opportunities for Maryland MBE partners of court at Cordish projects outside of the state. In addition, Maryland Live has made capital investments in the state to the tune of $750 million we opened just prior to COVID a 310 room hotel and 7,000 seat live entertainment venue and have continued to reinvest in our property. While sports betting in itself would likely generate roughly 10 to $20 million annually, if sports betting, including mobile licenses were tethered to, to the casinos, the state could realize significant new tax revenue in the range of 80 to $100 million as a spinoff benefit from this new audience at the casinos. Maryland could realize up to five to four fold increase in tax revenue if it uses sports betting to promote the existing casino gaming experience. About half the states in the country have authorized sports betting, 
including all of our surrounding states. Every state with casinos that has added sports betting has licensed sports Mr. betting. Smith, your three minutes is mm -hmm. up. Do you have a last single sure. sentence to share with us? Sure, absolutely. Uh, we believe that there is a win-win path here for sports betting in Maryland that can result in meaningful minority inclusion while maximizing state revenues. First, we urge the committee to consider okay. amendments to provide more license. Mr. Smith, Mr. Yeah. Smith, that is that is the summary. Uh, we uh, again just giving everyone three minutes. Uh, we do have your written testimony as well, um, Mr. Watson. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Kerry Watson, Regional Vice President for Government Affairs for MGM Resorts International, here in support of House Bill 940 with amendments. I'd like to start it off by thanking the speaker for drafting House Bill 940 and supporting the state's interest in sports betting. You know, I, I would like to think that MGM National Harbor and the casino industry has been tremendous partners with the state of Maryland and funding its education. In your packets, we have offered testimony, including some of our thoughts for amendments, details about what the industry has brought to the state, including the fact that we've uh, provided $5 billion of tax revenue, investments, and jobs. However, I realize that much of the discussion in 2021 is rightfully behind around social justice and the goals of ensuring that Black, Brown, and the economically developed, uh, disadvantaged, excuse me, have an opportunity to grow wealth in our communities. MGM National Harbor, and I'm confident the other casino operators in the state wish to be part of this national conversation. So in terms of sports betting, it's our hope that we'll be allowed to continue to drive even more revenue to the state and create even more uh, success, successful stories from certified small businesses and other businesses in the state. Uh, the winter before Super Bowl, I was in my office in National Harbor and drove across the bridge, across the Woodrow Wilson Bridge into Virginia, and I did what I'm pretty sure a lot of Marylanders did that day. And that's I made a sports bet on a legal mobile application. You know, we've been working on this, this bill or this issue diligently since 2018. And I hope that within the next few months, it'll be a situation where me, just like a number of other Marylanders, or many, many other Marylanders, will be able to make these kind of bets in our own state. And, you know, we've been able to follow data that proves and supports the fact that better shop for the best payouts and odds especially for sports bettors, the big sports bettors, the ones you really want to capture, they will travel or stand in line and maximize their return. And as you've witnessed in the District of Columbia, this is what you've seen. The way to do that is to have an attractive tax rate through a reputable and experienced operator. Uh, we also know that there's incredible potential in this market. As example, BetMGM, when it was established in New Jersey, we signed up an additional 150,000 new customers to our MLife program. As part of M Life, we were able to market these new customers directly and drive significant business into our casinos. This incremental gaming revenue should provide a quick and significant increase to the Maryland Education Trust Fund, the General Fund, Prince George's County, and the employees and MBEs we hire. Because we've already gone through this significant and challenging suitability process, we are ready to get to work on this as soon as you approve it. So we will continue to work with this committee to address the overarching goals of the legislature in into a structure that is not only workable, but ultimately successful as well. Look forward to talking to you all about it more. Thank you, Mr. Watson. We next have John Pappas. Thank you, Chairwoman Kaiser and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on behalf of Idea Growth. Uh, we were honored to testify in person last year, and we thank the committee today for holding today's virtual discussion. A lot has changed since last year's hearing. Uh, notably, the people of Maryland have spoken, and on November 3rd, they overwhelmingly endorsed the concept of legal sports betting. Another change is that Virginia launched its mobile sports betting market, and Pennsylvania, another neighboring state, has seen its online sports betting market nearly double in terms of operators and revenues since this time last year. Throughout the U.S., internet betting represents nearly 80% of all wagers placed and industry experts predict that 90% of all legal wagers will soon be coming from a phone or a laptop. Mobile competition is vital to developing a thriving industry that maximizes customer engagement and tax revenues. While HB 940 does seek to create a competitive balance, we believe that there should be at least as many licenses, online licenses available as there are class A and class B retail only licenses. 
the true opportunity for Maryland's minority and women-owned business community and for the existing land-based gaming and racing industry is the ability to offer mobile betting along with a retail sports book. Increasing the number of potential mobile operators isn't just good for Maryland consumers and businesses, but it will mean more money to the state in a way of upfront licensing fees and long-term tax revenues. New Jersey has been a centerpiece of how online betting competition can drive economic growth. Just look at the September and October betting revenue numbers for the past three years. In 2018, there were only eight online sports books and they produced 3 million in tax revenue over those two months. In 2019, there were 18 online sports books and they brought in 9 million for the state. In 2020, the market swelled to 21 competitors and the state came away with 12.5 million in taxes in just those two months. Colorado and Indiana are two other states that are similarly sized to Maryland and each state allows for more than 30, let me repeat, more than 30 mobile operators to be authorized. In both states, as competition has grown, so has revenue. Colorado has had record month to month growth since they launched last, last May and Indiana took in nearly three times as much tax revenue from sports betting in January, 2021 than they did in January, 2020. The evidence is clear, more competition will bring more revenue to the state, revenue that will help pay for education. We urge the committee to support changes to the bill that will ensure competition for mobile sports betting for the minority and women owned business communities and for Maryland's land-based gaming and racing entities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Idea Growth is eager to work with all Maryland lawmakers and stakeholders to establish a robust and competitive industry that sparks economic growth investment, and most importantly, tax revenues to the state. Appreciate your time and happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to call on one more person before we take another round of questions. Uh, Joe Briggs. Madam Chair, I got a message. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Mr. Briggs? Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. So uh, my name is Joe Briggs with the NFL Players Association. I am here representing not only the NFL Players Association, uh, but thank you very much for your time today to the committee, to the committee chair, and to all the people who spoke before me. There have been some interesting comments about what should happen with gambling, and I wanted to make sure that while we've provided our written testimony, we brought up four specific points. As one of the few representatives of people who are actually going to be bet on, there's some things that are generally concerning to us about the structure and, and of, of betting as a construct. Uh, though we are in support of gambling happening because we understand that it provides ex additional, not only entertainment to our fans, but also enjoyment to the people who watch the members of my association and the other professional associations play. There are just some concerns around four topics that I'll bring up with you and maybe a fifth topic that I'll discuss within my three minute time. First is the personal safety of the athletes involved. As with most legislation, there's very little mention of what should happen if someone were to not only try to influence betting through providing some type of compensation to an athlete outside of the construct of the con contract, but also because many of these constructs also have mobile betting in place where betting could take place in the facilities where the athletes are also playing. The potential exists for a person's family, uh, the family members of a person who's participating in a contest to be in close proximity to those people who may also be placing a mobile bet. Now, if that person has an unfavorable outcome of that bet and does something to either assault that person's family member who perhaps caused that person to lose that bet, there's usually no construct outside of regular criminal law to address that situation. We think that perhaps some consideration for the personal safety of our athletes, their family members, and also the other staff people that work in our sports should be taken into consideration. The second thing that we should talk about or that we wish to have more conversation around is the reporting of prohibited conduct. So prohibited conduct in this context could be someone showing up to the front doorstep of a member of the Baltimore Ravens door and dropping off a bag of cash to him. Would he then call the Owens uh, Mills police department uh, to try to figure out whether or not they should be the person to contact, or is there better direction on who he would contact to say that someone's trying to unduly influence him? The language in the bill itself is 
unclear as to what would happen in that scenario and some direction would probably benefit not only our players and our members and other people who may participate in sport, but also would provide some level of at least a surety to the people who are betting on these games that there is a construct in place to investigate things that may try to influence sport in a different way. And then third, uh, as we get into those investigations, there has to be some consideration into multi-state investigations. As uh, representative of professional football players, the contests generally happen between two different states or locations. So for instance, if there's a game that happens in, let's say Tampa, uh, between a team from Baltimore and a team from Seattle, Washington uh, at the end of a season. Mr. Briggs, yeah. Mr. Briggs, um, your, your time is up. Uh, your, I think if, if we have your written testimony, um, but is, do you have another sentence to sh say, not, not a whole paragraph? Certainly. The sentence I'll say is that as you're considering how you're going to put together your gambling construct, please remember the safety and considerations of those people who will actually be bet on, as well as their participation in this operation as well. Um, I know Thank you. I Thank you. Um, Ms., uh, we do have a question for this, uh, for this group. Delegate Buckle. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just did want to ask because this is probably maybe the first time of all the panels we've heard, we've heard a lot about equity of where the licenses would be assigned. <clears throat> but some of you, I think Mr. Smith, Mr. Hogan and others brought up, uh, Mr. Watson, exactly how this works for the casinos and what, what the real revenues are. And it's one of my concerns as we talk about creating more and more licenses. Uh, I think maybe we do need to have maybe some more licenses or different ways to look at it than the original bill. But I did some back of the envelope map uh, math, uh, DLS is estimating that the licensees in the furthest projected out year, 2026, would bring in $88.9 million in gross revenue. So that, you know, not accounting for what they would have to pay the employees to work in the sports book and the, the fees to William Hill and the other agencies and DraftKings and FanDuel to provide the, the electronic services. $88.9 million would be the total amount and I just, just divided that out by 14 because the bill would now provide for at least 14 brick and mortar licenses, 10 uh, mobile licenses. So there would have to be at least 14 licenses because the 10 mobiles could, could match up in theory. Maybe they don't. And what my, what my Google machine told me was the math is that $6.35 million uh, on average per licensee. And whether Mr. Hogan or Mr. Watson or Mr. Smith, who's ever in the industry, uh, is it your guys' position being the experts in sports gambling that sports gambling as a complete standalone uh, really isn't as, as lucrative as what some people may think? And it, it mainly helps to drive a lot of ancillary income within an entire industry of gambling. So you can go and do sports gambling. You can also bet on other traditional forms of gambling, restaurants, drinks, hotels, whatever. Can you give me some insight about that? Because the math to me doesn't look like, as we add more and more and more licensees, that maybe it will be actually profitable for some of these licensees to a significant extent. Well, if I may, I, I, I don't want to speak to the profitability, but I will say that number one, that as uh, Maryland Live is very much committed to uh, minority inclusion and participation. So I just want to make that very clear. The question is balance. And how do you find the right balance in this legislation? Uh, you're absolutely right that you can't get watered down here. Uh, we do believe very strongly that um, by placing, you know, by limiting the non- Uh-oh, you froze up. Did anyone else want to answer that question as well while we wait for and to come back. Madam Chair, um, PJ Hogan, Delegate Buckle, I, that's kind of why I made the statement earlier in my testimony that while sports betting sounds great, it, it's not a huge- oh it's, oh, it's great, Mr. Hogan. It's great, believe me. <laughs> For you, maybe. But I, I refer you all to your own Department of Legislative Services. They had an, uh, an analysis of all the states that have sports betting now and and look at the state share under each of those states i mean it's uh you know west virginia five million dollars uh um arkansas seven hundred sixty nine thousand. new york 1.8 million dollars um 
you know, it, it's not, it's why I made the point earlier, you've had very successful partners with the casinos that have generated a lot of money for the education trust fund. Um, that's why we view this more as an amenity because our competitor states have it. If I could, if I could offer a bit more, um, delegate, sure. you know, there's a, there's, there's a sweet spot there. Um, obviously if you want to engage the most players, you need to encourage that they come off of the illegal market. And the way to do that is to have a tax rate that benefits the player because tax rate impact the payout. And if you don't maximize the payout, they will choose to stay either in the illegal market or choose to shop their business around to locations where their opportunity for payouts, for high payouts are, are improved. So there's a sweet spot in there, I would argue, for the state, for the operator, and of course, for the player. But you know, understand that the illegal market has a 0% tax rate. They're not paying anyone but the player. So they will have the best odds. They will have the best payouts. And we, I'm sorry, I should say the state should look to engage as many of those players that are actively playing right now. Uh, and the best way to do that is with a, a better tax rate. Chairman Kaiser, if I may. Sure. Um, I, I will say Mr. Hogan's um, analysis may be a little off because two of the states that he mentioned there, uh, Arkansas and New York, do not allow for mobile sports betting. And as I explained, mobile sports betting, sports betting is the vast majority of the revenue driver for, uh, for this business. So it would be imperative for the brick and mortar casinos as well as MBE licenses to have the opportunity to have a mobile sports betting license uh, to fully maximize the value of sports betting for the state. And um, I, I have not looked at the, um, the, the analysis, but uh, 86 million in gross gaming revenue from sports betting seems rather low when you look at a state like uh, Indiana, which is similarly sized to Maryland and uh, is producing uh, an excess of 25 million a month in gross gaming revenue from sports betting. So that 86 million, I don't know where that number came from. Yeah, I, I well, think they're actually estimating gonna, 104. I'm going to, Delegate Buckle? Uh, yeah, I they're just, actually estimating 104, but that's what the state share coming out. The operators would just keep 88. Uh, Madam Chair, my apologies. I got disconnected there. I hope I answered uh, the gentleman's uh, question. Yes, and, and yes. I know that, Thank again, you. this is, today's hearing is a chance for everyone to ask questions. The different competing numbers, we will have chance in uh, public work sessions and other times for everyone to share that data. So we're gonna go on to the next set of questions that we have from Delegate Ebersole. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, uh, Mr. Hogan, could you quote a lot of states? Could you quote what New Jersey is getting annually? Yeah, New Jersey, I think has absolutely been the most successful. Remember, they've been doing it forever. So let's see, New Jersey, um, the state share is 96,828,000. Yes. and. Uh, it was pointed out that we came in late on casino gambling, and we did very well because we watched what other states did. I point that out here. Mr. Uh, Kerry Watson, um, you suggested that the tax rate, if it's higher, they don't, uh, the, other, the other people don't pay a tax. Are you suggesting that you would offer a, a, a lower odds on this? Because it's not the buyer who's paying the tax. It's you. You're paying the tax on what you win. Would you, are you suggesting you wouldn't be able to be competitive, that they would offer better odds than you would? The lower the tax rate, the more competitive you can be. Uh, yeah, because not, that does directly, that does directly impact what the payout is. So you would, so you would, you would, you would suggest that your, your odds on a particular game bet would be not as good as an offshore company. It's not necessarily about the odds. It's about what the payout might be. What, what attracts a customer to a bet? The pay, well, it's both, really. It's the odds and the payout. But the payout would be impact, impacted by the odds, but also by the amount that the state and the casino operator were to keep. Thank you. you if you look in D.C., as an example, uh, there are two operators in the district right now. One is the D.C. Lottery, and one is William Hill at Capital One Arena. And if you were to take a side-by-side -side comparison of what their payouts are, if you were to make a bet what you would actually win, William Hill is dramatically better. And for that reason, if you look at DC's numbers, the GGR on the William Hill product in, in money coming in to the city has 
dwarf what the DC lottery has done to this point. And you and I, I mean, don't I'm have sorry. to talk offline. Uh, We're Mr. Gonna get Watson, would you, Mr. Payouts and odds. Mr. I, Watson? I yes, ma'am. Would, would you suggest that, uh, I mean, what you seem, what you're comparing there are two legal markets and one will argue that people will pay a certain premium to get out of the illegal market and know that their bet is safe, secure, and that they'll always get the payout. So I'm not sure that was a, a fair comparison. And I guess I have to say, isn't that so? Uh, we have three more people to testify on this bill. Uh, after this bill, to everyone that's in, in the room that was here, this bill, uh, we're going to clear out the uh, the Zoom room a little bit. And if, if you are coming back for another bill, um, you can come back in at that time. Uh, but first, we will take uh, Jason Toshes from the score. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, um, Speaker Jones, and, and members of the committee. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jason Toshis, Director of Regulatory Affairs and Market Development for the SCORE. Thank you for providing me with an opportunity to um, testify today and articulate our full support for establishing a competitive market for regulated sports betting in Maryland. The SCORE is the second most popular sports media app in North America after the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act, or PASPA, was overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. We launched uh, the SCORE Bet, our mobile sports book, and we're now licensed and operating in New Jersey, Colorado, Indiana, and Iowa. To fully maximize the sports betting opportunity, we respectfully suggest that HB 940 be amended to increase the number of mobile-only licenses from 10 to 24. We believe this amendment would offer the greatest amount of competition among operators, produce the maximum market size and state revenue, and enhance consumer protections. In New Jersey, which is the most mature sports betting market outside of Nevada, 90% of the state's handle or total amount of money wagered is online. And in Pennsylvania, 90% of the state's handle is online. And in Indiana, 85% of the state's handle is online. We believe indicating a strong customer preference for online sports betting. To put just 10 licenses into perspective, West Virginia, a state with less than 2 million residents, authorized up to 15 online sports books. As you've heard, Colorado, a state of about equal population size to Maryland, authorized up to 33 online sports books and up to 39 online sports books in Indiana. One more example, um, a little closer to home, that I think highlights why it's so important to create a competitive market for sports betting is Virginia. Last year, the Commonwealth authorized just 12 licenses for sports betting and received 25 applications. And the General Assembly is now contemplating legislation to create more licenses available. Um, we believe the data in New Jersey is demonstrating that the greatest number of operators in the market will produce the largest possible market size. New Jersey's handle is roughly $1 billion a month, which is a national record. And if you look on the revenue side, New Jersey and Indiana with competitive markets are far outpacing other jurisdictions when you look at gross gaming revenue per adult over the trailing 12 months. By creating competition, you force operators to continually innovate, offer better pricing and promotions, and spend on marketing, all of which is designed to draw customers from the black market. And uh, by doing that, it will continually grow the state's regulated market and the state's portion of its tax revenue uh, will grow with it. We're confident a competitive market uh, will, will allow Maryland residents with the widest possible breadth of operators to choose from. Um, we uh, thank you again uh, for providing me with an opportunity to testify. We respectfully request a favorable uh, with amendment report and hope to work with you and your colleagues um, over the coming weeks and months. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fox. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of HB 940 on behalf of FanDuel. I'll keep it brief since so many great points have already been made and we've been here for a couple hours. FanDuel is proud to have been one of the primary supporters of the ballot measure to legalize sports wagering, which was overwhelmingly approved by Marylanders. We look forward to working with you and finding a sports wagering framework that maximizes tax revenue for the state, provides strong consumer protections for Maryland sports fans and creates meaningful opportunities for minority owned businesses. FanDuel Group currently operates 15 brick and mortar sports books in nine states.
We believe that competition and convenience of mobile wagering are necessary elements of providing an attractive alternative to the illegal sports wagering market, which is not regulated, does not pay licensing fees and taxes, and offers no consumer protections. Despite this, it is estimated that nearly 1.3 million Marylanders are using Ill illegal options to bet on sports today. And based on estimates by the lottery, uh, Maryland is losing out on over 43 million in potential tax revenue per year. To bring this activity into the regulated market, the state needs leading operators like FanDuel with a proven track record to grow the market. Many of these investments would benefit Maryland's businesses across sports franchises, local television, local radio, and advertising. FanDuel would like to thank Speaker Jones for her extraordinary commitment to addressing racial and economic justice in this legislative session. I'd like to thank the committee as well, obviously. Along with many others in Maryland and around our country, FanDuel has devoted time and effort over the last six months considering how we can be a positive force in this critical agenda for our country. Yesterday, FanDuel and the Washington football team on the heels of our mobile sports wagering launch in Virginia announced a $1 million joint contribution to the United Negro College Fund. This contribution will benefit students at the five historically black, excuse me, colleges and universities located in Virginia. The fund will provide aid grants for those students seeking emergency assistance for technology, housing, food security, tuition, and other education related expenses. While we recognize that we have considerable work left to do to maximize our own contribution to this national effort, we're excited about this first step and hope to replicate it in Maryland and around the country. Thank you and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Cook, last person to testify. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, and, and thank you to Speaker Jones for all of your work on this sports betting legislation as well. Uh, my name is Sarah Koch. I'm testifying on behalf of DraftKings, which currently offers sports betting in 14 states, and we actively supported the sports betting referendum in Maryland just last year. Uh, we do support House Bill 940 with amendments. Um, we believe that a competitive mobile market will create the best outcomes for the state. And I know that we've covered a lot of ground in you know, this meeting already. So I just like to highlight a few specific uh, proposed amendments that I don't think have been raised yet. Uh, first, the, current, the bill currently provides a, a cap for the number of mobile licenses, but it doesn't provide a floor. Uh, so we just urge you to require that all available licenses will be awarded if there are a sufficient number of, of qualified applicants. Um, Secondly, the bill doesn't currently contemplate any specific time frame for the licensing and regulatory process, um, especially given the in-depth nature of, of kind of the structure that's contemplated here. That could potentially take a while. Um, and in order to generate revenue for the state as quickly as possible, we would suggest trying to provide some kind of time frames for that process. Um, and finally, as has been mentioned before, uh, Maryland has had the benefit of seeing what has worked in other states. And so we just urge you to look to other states for consistency in some of the defined terms in the bill, um, as well as other, other provisions within here. Uh, it just eases things from an operational perspective and those have proven to be effective. Um, so that's it. Thank you for your, your time and consideration and we look forward to working with you. Um, Thank you all. Uh, I, I have a question for uh, Mr. Fox and uh, Ms. Koch, uh, and maybe this does impact Mr. Tasha's as well. Um, and I certainly appreciate what both Mr. Fox and Mr. Uh, Ms. Koch said about uh, helping out with the referendum and Mr. Fox uh, particularly mentioned consumer protection. Uh, mm -hmm. In the past week, I have heard commercials from two of your three companies uh, talking about betting and at the beginning of the ad, if you lose money, you get $100. If you lose $1,000, this happens, that happens. At the end of the ad, it's clear what you're offering someone is betting credits. I, can, I have reached out to the attorney general's office to figure out a way to put something in law to not allow that for anyone doing business with the state of Maryland. And so I, I would like to hear what you all have to address. I don't deny that you should do promotions. I welcome the promotions. I welcome all of your companies. Uh, but uh, while the state may not make a lot of money out of sports betting, there is the belief that anyone with a license will be making money hand over fist. Can we do that without um, misleading people? I know that's a, a tough question, but it, I found the ads this week to be very disappointing. Delegate Kaiser, this is Corey Fox, I'm happy to take a swing at it, though I don't know if I can answer your specific question without looking at the specific ad that you saw. I think we take this issue really seriously. Every ad is 
run through our legal department that, you know, has thought through these issues. We've been around for a little while and we know how attorneys general generally look at these questions. So ha happy to discuss offline the specific ad you saw that you think wasn't accurate, but we take it really seriously to make sure that the language of those ads is accurate. It, it was radio ads. It's, uh, it's telling people you're giving them back money and then, but that's not what you're doing. But yes, I think Ms. Koch wanted to answer as well. Um, that's right. I think we, we're in the same position. I'd certainly be happy to, to take a look at those specific ads. Um, responsible gaming is certainly something that we take very seriously uh, in all aspects of our business. It's a priority. Um, it's we also, you know, very much value truth and honesty in, in our advertising. Um, I will say that in terms of promotions, um, promotional game <laughs> credits are something that are very um commonly issued in the industry as a way to um, to have you know players kind of try out try out the the products um, I'm so all for we, I'm all for promotions with credits tell okay. people they're getting credits that's yep. all I'm saying don't tell them they're getting dollars tell them they're getting credits got it okay understood yep and we again yes. we do we do value you know truth in our advertising well I, I appreciate both of your answers because um uh Everything, all of our dealings up till now have uh, I've been very pleased with both of you and, and both of what I've heard from both companies. But it's uh, the ads in just this past week uh, that have that have worried me. So, thank you. We can we can talk further offline. Thank you. Uh, any other questions uh, for this panel? All right, uh, members, seeing none, we are done with the hearing on House Bill 940. Uh, we are moving next to uh, two bills that we have on economic development uh, with uh, Delegate Chief, who first showed up an hour and a half ago, and I laughed her off and said, please don't come back for another hour and a half or more. And here she is. Uh, All right. House Bill 1014. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for your great accommodation. I am very pleased to be back to Ways and Means for the last time of this session. Thank you for your great work. I do want to uh, take this opportunity um, by saying I first want to thank the extraordinary work of this committee, um, especially Madam Chair and our Majority Leader in advancing this big relief bill, which is related to what I'm about to present. And that was a lifeline for many of our small businesses. Obviously, this bill was drafted before we passed, passed the relief bill. Uh, which will make the last part of my bill unnecessary or less pressing. So I just want to preface that because this bill otherwise would be revenue neutral because of the rest of the because the rest of the programs in this bill are contingent on the eligible financial assistance from the federal government. This bill's intent is to direct eligible federal aid to helping those hardest to hit small businesses recover from this pandemic with some parameters and by connecting funding with technical assistance to ensure their long-term recovery. As written, this bill uh, has four major components, but the most important are the first three parts, which are, as I said, revenue neutral. So let me just focus on these three. They are uh, an emergency loan program, an emergency grant program, and a business recovery assistance program. All these programs target eligible small businesses as defined in the bill that have fewer than 50 employees uh, who have experienced at least 25% revenue loss year to year between the beginning of the pandemic to a comparable defined period a year later. In addition, this bill also requires the programs to prioritize funding or assistance, starting with those businesses with fewer than 10 employees, then move on to those between 11 to 25 and so on until uh, 50 employees. Specifically, uh, the first program, the emergency loan program, is modeled after a similar loan program uh, administered by the Department of Commerce, which has been very effective in helping our businesses recover. It is for small woman and minority owned businesses, um, and it is interest free for the first 12 months and does not require any collateral. The emergency grant program will be administered also uh, by the uh, through commerce, but uh, it will be uh, administered by the local counties through the application to the Department of Commerce. It is for businesses with fewer than 15 employees. 
Um, the logic of that is because many of them may not have received assistance in previous rounds or other programs. Um, the counties have some discretion and flexibility as to the amount for each grant and other requirements. The third program is the Business Recovery Assistance Program, which will be managed by the Maryland SBDC, the Small Business Development Center. SBDC is best positioned to leverage its extensive network and resources to reach those most vulnerable businesses to provide hands-on customized services and guidance. Um, and the need for this program is that many small businesses may not even know about the loans and grants programs we have or how to apply for them. And most have never experienced such a traumatic experience such as a COVID-19. So they really need both managerial and the technical assistance at no cost to build back up. Eligibility for this uh, assistance program is the same as the loan program, which is 50 employees or fewer and 25% revenue loss. The combination of funding and technical uh, assistance is critical to business recovery and success, as you will hear more about later. Each of the above three programs has a corresponding special fund, which is contingent on the permissible use of the federal relief aid to our state. The final part of this bill, which is the reason this bill has a fiscal cost, is up to this committee's uh, discretion. If you think we should just take it out, I'm fine with it. And so does Senator Hester, who is the Senate sponsor of this bill. In summary, this bill builds on our past work in providing small business relief. But let's remember, small business recovery takes time. And no matter our intent, many businesses were not able to access our earlier assistance and will continue to struggle or even go under. So this bill simply says when we do receive, if and when, when we receive the federal aid eligible for small business assistance, let's be more intentional and help those who need help the most. With that, I wanna thank you and turn to my witnesses. Thank you, Delegate Chi. Um, I do have to um, depart for a moment. Is Delegate Washington available to take over? Delegate Washington. All right, there you are. Uh, I'll just call the next person while, if you're opening up your documents, but Sarah Price. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and honorable members of the committee. My name is Sarah Price and I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Retailers Association. I'd like to start by thanking Delegate Chief for sponsoring this important bill. We are so grateful for all of the support that you've given to the small business community and retailers this year. The last 11 months have been a really hard time for everyone and especially for the business community. Your local retailers have struggled through shutdowns, parsing conflicting information coming from the federal, state and local levels, implementing brand new sanitizing and distancing requirements and operating as de facto security guards for, uh, to uphold mask mandates. Essential business employees have put themselves at risk for the last year to continue to provide for their communities and make sure that their neighbors have the food and supplies that they need. We at the Retailers Association have done everything that we can to support the business community during this pandemic. And in every conversation that we've had with members, with Main Street directors and with businesses all across the state, the biggest cry for help that we heard over and over again was we need financial support, we need funding. PPP money and other funds that eventually came down the pipeline were helpful, but they dried up quickly if businesses were able to access it at all. No state agency appears to be tracking how many businesses have permanently closed due to the pandemic, but we all know that retailers have shuttered for good in every community across the state. The funding sources proposed in this bill would make an enormous difference to provide relief for the businesses that are still hanging on, and we urge a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have Laura Brown. Good afternoon, Chair Chair Kaiser, Vice President Washington. Vice, I'm sorry, Vice Chair Washington, members of the committee, and Delegate Chi. I'm Laura Brown, the Deputy Director of the Maryland Small Business Development Center, widely known as the SBDC. I'm pleased to offer a brief summary of the written statement submitted for the record in support of HB 1014. The Maryland SBDC provides management and financial consulting to entrepreneurs at no cost to them. We also offer group training and market research. Our clients range from the entrepreneur with a great idea to the established business owner seeking to grow. 
Last year, we served over 9,000 clients, helping them raise more than $148 million in capital, supporting nearly 54,000 Maryland jobs, and even in the midst of the pandemic, helping 267 entrepreneurs start new companies. Many of these companies have fewer than 20 employees. The SBDC leverages our extensive network of public and private partnerships to help us reach the state's smallest companies. Our results prove that we are uniquely positioned to assist the most vulnerable small businesses to weather the pandemic. HB 1014, would provide $20 million to allow us to help even more small business owners throughout the state to survive the pandemic and to pivot to thrive in a post-pandemic environment. This bill would give us the resources to provide even more in-depth accounting, e-commerce, and other customized assistance needed by struggling entrepreneurs. We have experience working with the prior Strategic Assistance Consulting Fund upon which this legislation is based and whose lessons we can apply to this program. Maryland's small business community deserves every opportunity to succeed. So we urge a favorable report for HB 1014. We promise not to let you or your constituents down. Thank you. Thank you, Robert Giamano. GMO. No. Um, okay, uh, is there, uh, are there any questions for these speakers? Okay. Or the sponsor of the bill? Seeing none, thank you very much. That concludes the public hearing for House Bill 1014. Uh, we will now pivot to House Bill 892, uh, Delegate Buckle. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. It's time for Buckle Palooza, four straight bills, apparently designed by uh, yours truly, uh, all of which uh, I think are, are pro-business bills. The first of which I believe is, is probably the, the most significant for consideration for the committee. Uh, I had the opportunity, still have the opportunity and the privilege to be the co-chair uh, of a task force that this committee helped to establish last year. Uh, that is focused on the economic future of Western Maryland, particularly the three Western counties of the state. Western Maryland is a region really extends in legislative parlance from Carroll County West, uh, but the three counties, Washington, Allegheny, and Garrett are, are, are somewhat different a little bit from Frederick and Carroll, our, our neighbors. Uh, this bill, 892, is a recommendation that the TEDCO representatives on the task force made, and we worked together in the task force to bring to fruition it would provide for a Maryland technology infrastructure pilot program and fund to be created within TEDCO. And what it essentially would do is help to assist uh, and fund and find ways to bring technology oriented businesses that maybe already exist in the state of Maryland or are reaching production phase in the state of Maryland, perhaps in the I-95 corridor and help to keep them in Maryland as they expand and grow whether that be in biotechnology, cybersecurity, other technology endeavors. Uh, Western Maryland is poised with Frostburg State University, which is located in my district and also has a strong presence in downtown Hagerstown and Washington County. Uh, we are poised to be a part of the state's success story with respect to technology, but we need some help and we need some direction from TEDCO and from the state uh, to help incentivize and, and move some of these jobs uh, in a growth pattern, not stealing jobs from anywhere, but assisting with growth. When someone from the I-95 corridor wants to grow and they perhaps need a, a production facility for something that is technology oriented, advanced manufacturing or otherwise, we'd like to keep them in Maryland rather than sometimes see them go to Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, other states in the general region. And that's the goal of this, this fund. Uh, the fund is not a mandate of $2.5 million. The fund says that we, we would like to see the governor appropriate up to $2.5 million uh, for the administration of the fund, and each individual grant could be no more than $500,000. Each of the grants or investments that the fund would make would have to be matched at a two-to-one level through private investment uh, and or you know, participation from local entities, local economic development entities. So it's not uh, a government giveaway in any way. It's simply a, a means to help incentivize and spark 
uh, technology business development and technology jobs in the three western counties. And that's that's essentially what the what the bill does uh, and what it would do. And I think we have some good support, uh, perhaps from the Hogan administration and from uh, the leadership to try to get this bill done this year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for the sponsor of the bill? Seeing none, uh, Troy Lamel Stovall. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Delegate Buckle, thank you for your, your leadership on this matter. It's very important and something we're very, I can tell you, I'm personally passionate about. I've spoken uh, extensively to our friends at Frostburg on this matter, so we're excited about this. Uh, Chair Kaiser, Vice Chair Washington, it's good seeing you both again, as well as members of the House Ways and Means Committee. For the record, my name is Troy Lamel Stovall, and I serve as the Chief Executive Officer and the Executive Director for Maryland Technology Development Corporation, better known as TEDCO which is dedicated to economic growth through the fostering of an inclusive entrepreneurial and innovation ecosystem. TECO discovers, invests in, and helps build great Maryland-based technology companies. Uh, as, as Delegate Buckle knows, TECO and Western Maryland are linked given Western Maryland leadership were, were a big part of the General Assembly members that advocated for its formation. So it's with that sense of mutuality that I humbly provide support for House Bill 892, which represents one of 14 recommendations from the Task Force for the Economic Future of Western Maryland. The task force suggests that when considering strategies for economic development in Western Maryland, policy proposals that encourage the formation and success of new and small business can help increase economic dynamism in the region. So House Bill 892 is based in part on recommendations of the Excel Maryland Steering Committee uh, convened by the administration in 2017 and 2018. That steering committee concluded that for Maryland to remain competitive, it must invest in large scale innovation infrastructure projects that capitalize on the state's assets while building a density of new economic activity. This bill will provide a valuable economic development tool for Western Maryland and serve as a roadmap for potential expansion to a statewide effort. As an engineer by training, I value the role that pilots can play in developing a larger implementation. Pilots allow for the testing of hypotheses and scenarios in a smaller and or more contained environment to ascertain what a more comprehensive strategy would resemble. This pilot program established by House Bill 892 would build on TEDCO's existing Rural Business Innovation Initiative, which provides funding and advisory services to early stage technology firm companies in the rural regions of Maryland. The pilot will provide insight into not only what might work in Western Maryland, what will work in Western Maryland, but also a blueprint on how to invest in early stage ventures across the state to provide long-term returns to Maryland by ensuring these young companies remain prosper and grow in Maryland. For these reasons, TECO encourages a favorable report on House Bill 892, and I'm available to address any questions or concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Stovall? Seeing none, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this public hearing for House Bill 892. Uh, Delegate Buckle, what's, what's your next bill? Uh, I think, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, it would be 1019. Okay. Uh, 1019, let's go. Go ahead. Okay. HB 1019, this is a bill, colleagues, that quite frankly I had drafted and prepared. Uh, really prior to the Relief Act that we all came together and passed a week or two ago, uh, and it included an element that was part of the Relief Act, and that is the sales and use tax vendor collection credit. Because we passed the Relief Act that includes those provisions, I hold no illusions that, you know, it would probably make a lot of sense to, to pass this bill in addition, uh, but I did have the bill drafted and prepared prior to that and, and probably just didn't withdraw it after we passed the Relief Act. My iteration of the vendor collection credit would be smaller on a monthly basis than the bill that we passed, which would allow up to $3,000, I believe, per uh, uh, sales and use tax vendor. Mine would only be $1,500 a month at maximum. For most vendors, it would probably be less. Uh, again, would be limited to those companies, 50 employees or smaller, but my credit would last longer because we all understand that even though, thank God, COVID-19 seems to be uh, coming down. The numbers and metrics seem to be coming down. Vaccinations go up. We are all praying that continues. I don't think any of us believe that it's just gonna magically go away and everything's going to return to normal economically in the next two or three months. Uh, so that that's the iteration of my bill. I put it forward for consideration if there's interest, but I certainly understand that we've already passed something similar to this. Uh, I don't know if great minds think alike or I'm just a copycat, I'm not sure but this was already included as a portion of what we did in the Relief Act. Got it, got it. Thank you, Delegate Buckle. Uh, any questions for Delegate Buckle on House Bill 1019? <clears throat> so
Seeing none, that concludes the House, the House bill hearing on uh, HB 1019, Delegate Buckle, House Bill 1052. 1052. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And this is this is very similar. I just got confirmation from uh, the incredibly capable George Butler uh, of our committee a day or two ago that the intent of House Bill 1052 was to allow uh, for businesses that had received uh, federal loans passed through the state through the CARES Act and other enactments of 2020 with respect to COVID-19, that they would uh, not incur tax liabilities when the federal government came in and said, hey, we're converting those loans to grants, essentially, if you use them for the right purposes, PPP and other things that provided for salaries for individuals and, and those expenses that we all supported during the uh, worst economic days of the pandemic. Uh, Mr. Butler has advised me and the comptroller's office has confirmed literally just a couple of days ago that because of some federal legislation that has been passed and interpretations made of the CARES Act and the PPP and other programs, they've determined at the federal level that converting those loans into grants will not generate taxable income for the companies. And because we in Maryland are coupled, as we all understand on this committee, to a large extent to the federal treatment of taxability of income, as a result, they would not be taxable here in Maryland either. So thankfully, my bill is already law and I didn't even have to do anything. Uh, so I don't necessarily think that it's, it's uh, probably needed for the committee to pass the bill. The bill's implications will already be how the comptroller treats income from those programs for businesses going forward. Thank you. Any questions for Delegate Buckle? Seeing none, that concludes the House bill hearing on HB uh, 1052. Delegate Buckle, House Bill 1057. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. House Bill 1057 is a, is a very minor little tax adjustment bill that has a fiscal note of only 700 and some million dollars. It's something that we probably all should uh, you know embrace. It's just a minor change to tax policy. I'm being facetious, obviously, to an extent. Uh, what the intent of House Bill 1057 is, is to recognize this. The largest sectors of our economy that have taken a hit from COVID-19 usually are those sectors that have sales tax requirements, whether they be retailers, whether they be uh, restaurants, uh, things of that nature that, that it, you know, have to pay the sales tax significantly have been some of the businesses most affected by COVID-19. What this bill would do is would reduce the general state sales and use tax from 6% to 5%, but only, but only for those businesses and for those sales made within the borders of Maryland. For those sales made from businesses through internet means, uh, cross-border means, that rate would stay at 6%, fully recognizing that for the, the, for the most part, uh, a lot of taxes generated by those internet sales go toward the Kerwin Fund or the Blueprint Fund uh, that sort of buttresses the Education Trust Fund. This bill would not affect those revenues at all. It would simply give a little bit of a leg up to our local retailers, to our brick and mortar retailers and restaurants, so that you know they would have a little bit of an advantage and a competitive advantage with respect to uh, calculating uh, sales taxes, remitting sales taxes, and advertising to their customers that, hey, you might be able to get something for a dollar cheaper or $10 cheaper or whatever it may be uh, if you just come to my store, if you just come to my restaurant, if you just come to my place of business in Maryland. I live in a region, I know many of you may live in a region, it's happening statewide, where retail brick and mortar centers, whether they be shopping malls, strip malls, whatever it may be, chain restaurant clusters are closing dramatically or under threat of closing. And I know we all love technology and we all love buying and selling things online, but we're going to have to deal with the fact that there are going to be ripples and repercussions from this behavior. And when you begin driving through your communities and saying, there was millions of dollars of commercial real estate that now lays vacant. There were hundreds of people who had middle-class jobs who are in starting jobs and first jobs who worked in those facilities those stores, those shops, those restaurants, they're all gone now. Uh, it's great to buy something on Amazon. I'm not against it, but I think we have to take into consideration all that we can do to help keep those jobs and help keep that tax revenue, property tax revenue, sales tax revenue, and otherwise uh, in our state and, and productive. And that's the intent of the bill. Thank you, Delegate Buckle. Any questions for Delegate Buckle on this bill? 
Seeing none, that concludes Buckle Palooza and uh, on House and House Bill 1057. Uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, we're going to turn to House Bill 982, Delegate Layman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the Ways and Means Committee. Um, for the record, Delegate Mary Layman uh, here to request your favorable consideration of House Bill 982. Uh, the bill creates an income tax credit for commercial or industrial properties that insulate HVAC piping and equipment to lower their greenhouse gas emissions and reduce their carbon footprint. Um, so the problem is that energy um, inefficiency in commercial and industrial buildings, such as schools and hospitals, are major sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Inadequate insulation in buildings is a major source of energy inefficiency, which allows outside air to come in and inside air to go out. This also leads to economic losses in the form of high heating and cooling bills. There is a simple and cost effective solution. It is the use of insulation around piping and HVAC equipment to prevent the air from entering or escaping a building. So quite simply, the bill encourages businesses, schools, and other entities to install mechanical insulation by offering state income tax credits for qualified expenses. The tax credit would apply to both labor costs uh, for assembly and installation, as well as materials, including facings and accessory products that are specifically used to regulate temperature of mechanical piping and equipment and heating and HVAC equipment. Um, it would be applicable to repair, to replacement and upgrading of existing systems. And to qualify, a business would have to invest a minimum of $10,000. The bill directs the Maryland Energy Administration to adopt guidelines for issuing these tax credits on a first come first serve basis. The tax credit cannot exceed 30% of the total cost of the business or other entities investment. Um, Mr. Chair, this bill would be a win all the way around. It really is a green jobs bill. It would benefit installers, customers who would save on heating and cooling bills and the environment because of the reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the insulation tax credit would incentivize the use of mechanical insulation. It would also help Maryland, of course, toward its ambitious goals of reducing its carbon footprint and reversing global warming and I urge a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Delegate Lehman for the sponsor of the bill? Seeing none, let's go to our first speaker. Uh, give me one second. Um, it's okay, we Brian, can Brian, Brian Cavey. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. I'm looking for this list. I can't find Fine. it. <laughs> Brian, uh, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Vice Chair Washington. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Delegate Layman. Uh, members of the committee, my name is Brian Cavey. I'm business manager of Heat and Frost Insulators and Allied Workers Local 24. I'm here on behalf of the 500 members of our local union, and we are the energy conservation specialists. I'm here to support this bill. Um, According to the National, National Insulation Association, 10 to 30% of all commercial buildings have damaged or missing insulation. Uh, when mechanical insulation is 100% complete, it reduces energy costs, energy usage, and it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the percentage of insulation that is damaged in the building could be small, uh, but the amount of energy loss and energy um, uh, 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 greenhouse gas emissions, I'm sorry, uh, is exponentially worse. For example, 30% of building insulation might be damaged, but causing 50 to 70% of energy of wasted energy. Um, there's no formal uh, mechanical insulation um, system inspection, except for one that is recognized by the National Insulation Association. Uh, insulation of a building envelope um, does not include mechanical insulation. And when you hear of energy inspections and building maintenance inspections, energy surveys, they usually talk about building envelope and weatherization. Um, and that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about mechanical insulation. Um, mechanical insulation offers an incredible return on investment. 
when a cap mechanical insulation is done as a repair or replacement or upgrade uh, in, on a heat system, it generally goes for about six months um, is typical for the return on investment. This bill will also increase um, jobs, uh, which will call for an increase in our workforce, which doesn't just increase jobs. We have careers, careers that start with a Maryland uh, apprenticeship registered training program um, that we have here and that there are uh, all over the state. Um, I have an example of a building uh, where mechanical insulation helped make the building more efficient. Uh, we got a call from the Maritime Institute. Maritime Institute is a training institute that is in Linthicum. And we were helped to solve a high heat problem that was in and around the kitchen and cafeteria area. A labor management team, including myself and a management representative from one of our signatory employers went out to the site. We did a heat loss analysis. We went into the mechanical room that was just behind the kitchen um, and found that the heat in the room was 104 degrees. That was because there was a lot of missing steam pipe insulation in the room. Um, we did a survey that I can all send you the information that includes the thermal photography um, that ultimately lowered the temperature in the room to 98 degrees. We saved the training institute $3,021 a year um, and reduced carbon emissions by 3.7 metric tons by just doing that one room um, repair. Um, it, while we did it for free, we did it using the apprentices, we used it as a training. Ultimately, it would have cost about 2,500 bucks, which leaves about a seven month return on investment. Uh, I urge a favorable report on this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cavey. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Mr. Craig Miller. Okay, uh, next we'll have uh, Pete. I'm just gonna say Mr. Pete. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good, yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, Vice Chairman Washington and Delegate Layman and the members of the committee for the opportunity to offer my testimony in support of HB 982. My name is Pete Alamini and I'm the Executive Director of the Insulators Labor Management Cooperative Trust or LMCT for short. The Maryland Mechanical Insulation Tax Incentive Bill would be a huge step to increase work opportunities for the people of Maryland and all at the same time reducing harmful air pollutants. There is no doubt that new energy technology will lead us to a path of alternative fuel sources but we have to be realistic and reasonable with a timeline of expectations. Dependency on fossil fuel will still be part of our energy consumption and commerce and transportation, but having it used efficiently is just plain smart energy stewardship. Ignorance about mechanical insulation and awareness of its benefits is unfortunately all too common. Please do not assume that building codes and other regulatory entities automatically incorporate proper and monitor mechanical insulation policy because it does not. This bill will ultimately result with more careers, not jobs, lifelong high paying skilled careers for the people of Maryland. The application of mechanical insulation will require training, expertise developed usually through US DOL apprenticeship programs. There are approximately 2,000 mechanical insulators and a multitude of businesses that are associated with the mechanical insulation. For example, the state of Montana conducted a statewide survey of just their schools and hospitals addressing how the lack of insulated mechanical systems impacted the state's operational costs. It was determined that investing with a strategic mechanical insulation plan was needed. This and other studies have been conducted with the same realization of the attention to mechanical insulation. If you would like, you can go to the website, mechanicalinsulatorslmct.com. <clears throat> there are more uh, audits that are there for your uh, witness. Mechanical insulation energy audits offer scientific engineered data that demonstrates the jaw dropping energy savings and the value of return on investment that mechanical insulation offers. 
Thank you for allowing me to share my support and recommendation for HB 982. Thank you. Uh, any questions for the last two speakers? Hearing none, that concludes the House Bill hearing, House the hearing on House Bill 982. Uh, we'll move on, members of the committee, we're going to move on to House Bill 1111, Delegate Wibble. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Washington. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. Um, it's good to be with you and honorable members of the Ways and Means Committee. House Bill 1111, I'm considering that a lucky number, as it wasn't in years past, as you've seen this bill in prior sessions. So I'm submitting this bill again this year as it seeks a completion of the work that was started back in 2018 when the legislature actually decoupled from the federal code for personal exemptions. House Bill 1111 asks you to do the same for itemized deductions and allow Marylanders to itemize deductions on their state return regardless of whether they have itemized on their federal income tax return. As a result of the federal government combining personal exemptions with the standard deduction, only the wealthiest of taxpayers with high deductions are generally the ones who still itemize on their federal return. Decoupling would restore the ability to itemize for middle-class taxpayers in Maryland. As, not, as I stated last year, there's a competitive nature to the state taxation of both its residents and businesses who choose to do business or to reside based upon this competitiveness. Doing nothing negatively impacts our ratings and rankings when compared to other states, as many states have already enacted or, or are enacting substantive tax changes as a result of the 2017 Federal Act, including the nearby state of Virginia. The fiscal note I know is still somewhat high. It's about half of what it was, I think, the first time I introduced this bill. So it is more reasonable, but I still believe that it's probably higher than what it should be. Um, but given that, I do ask for a favorable report on House Bill 1111. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Delegate Wibble? Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll go to be going this bill, uh, Paul Schwartz. Thank you. My name is Paul Schwartz, and I represent NARF, the National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association. I will keep my testimony concise and focused on two key points. First, as you may recall, the primary reason this bill did not get out of committee the last two years was because of the fiscal notes exorbitant price tag. I vehemently objected to that fiscal note, which I described as illogical because it was based on the false assumption that 680,000 Maryland taxpayers that had gone from itemizing to taking the standard deduction because of the newly increased federal standard deduction would, with decoupling, now return to itemizing on their state returns. This of course made no sense then, nor does it now, since the eliminated deductions have not been added back, not in this bill or any other bill. If you don't have deductions, you do not itemize. The state has been able to keep the windfall that elimination of deductions provided, and that will not change. There are, however, some Maryland taxpayers who, despite the increased federal standard deduction, had to forego it and continue to itemize on both their federal and state returns because they still did better continuing to itemize with the remaining deductions they had, even though their federal itemized deductions were less than the federal standard deduction. They itemized before decoupling and will continue to itemize with decoupling, but now with decoupling, we'll also be able to take the federal standard with no impact on state revenue. This bill is for these taxpayers. The problem is that legislative services does not have the capacity to identify exactly who in the 680,000 would actually go back and who would not without looking at each individual tax return. For that reason, they lump them all in a macro grouping. I take that right from the words of Robert Rearman 
the author of the fiscal note, and I quote, initial analysis of tax year 2017 and 2018 data show that taxpayers claiming state itemized deductions decreased by 670,900, a reduction of a, of a slightly less than one half with a similar increase in taxpayers claiming the state standard deduction, 687,600, end of quote. They lumped it together and that is reflected in the high cost. That was number one. Number two, the economy. During the economic challenges created by the worldwide coronavirus pandemic, the need to put money back into the pockets of Marylanders is critical to our economic recovery. Hey, Mr. Schwartz, Mr. Me? Schwartz, your time has expired. Can you give us your summarizing sentence, please? Summary is, is I'll keep it real simple. We're talking about the uh, pandemic and putting money back into pockets of Marylanders. That's why Biden uh, put forward the 1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan and why you and the governor are looking for ways of tirelessly putting back money oh, back in our pockets. Passage thank you, Mr. Schwartz. 1111 will do that. I, thank you, I Mr. urge the committee to issue a favorable report, but before I go, I just- Mrs. Schwartz, that's, that's, that's the end of your testimony, Mrs. Schwartz. Mrs. Schwartz, that's the end of your testimony. Once again, this important <laughs> legislation. Thank you. That concludes the public hearing for this bill. Thank you all. We're gonna move on to House Bill um, 1086. Delegate Kaiser. Thank you. Can you see me? Fantastic. Uh, thank you all. I urge the, uh, all of you to uh, uh, pass House Bill 1086. It's the Maryland Tax Credit Evaluation Bill to uh, make alterations. Uh, this timing is perfect while I'm picking up my daughter at daycare. Uh, just to say that I, we, we need to change the evaluation process. We have good tax credits. Uh, we have bad tax credits. And we need to uh, do some different evaluation of them. Get rid of the Tax Credit Evaluation Committee. <laughs> hey. and uh we need to make some other changes take a look at the bill uh commerce is in favor of this bill as well with some small changes and we're working with them to address their concerns anyway thank you all very much i urge you all to vote favorably on the bill any questions of the chair and her baby or maybe we'll ask them later <laughs> right <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the public hearing for House Bill 1086 and also concludes the public hearing for today. Uh, any announcements from our subcommittee chairs? Sing, Delegate Abrissol. Probably a early childhood on Tuesday, if you're marking Hi. the calendar for next week. Great. Uh, all right, seeing no other announcements, thank you, and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow.